In this lecture, I'm going to talk about cross-compiling and CGO. Go can cross-compile to any supported operating system and architecture. Cross-compiling means that I can compile on my Linux system a Go binary for a Mac or a Windows system. Architecture means I can do that for AMD64, that's the Intel architecture, or I can also do that for ARM64, which is now used by MacBooks. It can also be another architecture that is used on embedded devices or on servers. You need to supply the Go operating system environment variable and the Go arc environment variable during Go build to compile for another operating system or architecture. Go tool this list shows you the support combinations. So when you want to cross compile, you can use that command and then you can see the operating systems and the architectures that you can cross compile for. When not cross compiling, CGO will be enabled. When cross compiling, it will be disabled. CGO allows you to run C code within Go. This is relevant even if you're not using this feature yourself because standard Go packages like NET can use CGO, for example, for DNS resolving. CGO will link your binary to the current C library available on your operating system, but it will not work on an operating system with a different C library. So this is how it works when CGO is enabled. So CGO enabled equals one, go build. This is the default, so you don't really have to supply this. The result is a dynamically linked binary. You will have your Go binary, which is linked to the libc system library. This can be glibc, which is GNU libc, just libc or muscle, which is used by Alpine. And this is a library that is installed on the operating systems. It's an external file, so it's not in your Go binary. It's in the library directory on a Linux system. And you will need those files to be able to run this Go binary. So if you would now want to run your Go binary on another system, you might not have these files and your Go program will not work. It will not execute. It will execute with an error that you cannot find this C library. And that's why you have the C Go enabled equals zero Go build that you can do. And then the result is a statically linked binary. So you're not linking to this C library anymore rather than using these C functions. There's a pure Go implementation of these C libraries, for example, in the net package, and that results in one single binary. And now your binary is portable across all operating systems that it has been built for. So if it has been built for Linux, it will work on any Linux system. So this just creates one binary that is not dynamically linked. You would still need to cross compile if you want to run your binary on a Windows or a Mac system. So if you want to run your binary on Linux, Mac and Windows, you would have three binaries. Those would then all be statically linked so that you don't need any external C libraries. If you want your Go library to just run on a single machine, then you can use C Go and then it will link to these C libraries because you have those available on your system. So enabling C Go when you're not cross compiling may lead to a binary smaller in size as those C bindings for DNS resolver and networking will be in libc or in glibc. So it's not only the DNS resolver, it is also other parts that are using CGO. You could even use CGO yourself. You already have the C libraries bundled with your operating system, so there's no need to have them included again in every binary. So that's actually how Linux works and Unix as well. If you execute something like ls or cat or any other Linux command, those are dynamically linked so that you don't need all these libraries again in every single binary. Otherwise, every binary would be pretty big and then it would take a lot of this capacity for every single binary to have them statically linked. Also, if you have them statically linked, you would have to recompile everything. If you have a security bug in one of the libraries, if it's dynamically linked and there's a security bug, you just update the library, restart your binary, and then you will be using the new libraries. So there are definitely benefits in enabling CGO. It will also lead to faster builds. And that is why CGO is enabled by default if you are not cross compiling. Disabling CGO by default when you're cross compiling or with the flag 
is necessary when cross compiling and is also necessary if your C library on the destination system is different. For example, if you compile on an Ubuntu Linux, but you want to run on an Alpine Linux, you wouldn't think you would have to cross compile because it's still a Linux binary, but actually it will not work because Ubuntu Linux is using GNU libc and Alpine is using muscle libc. So let's have a quick look how this C go and cross compiling works. So this is my Mac operating system, but I'm going to start a Linux Docker container just so that I can show you how the linking works. I'm going to use Docker for this. So I'm going to enter Docker run, RM, make sure that the container is removed. After I exit the container, interactive mode, and my container is going to be Alpine Linux. So now I'm in my container. So I already downloaded this image earlier. That's why it's not downloading the image. It's cached. And I'm going to install Go first. apk add Go. And this is the package manager of Alpine. So you see here I'm running Alpine 3.16. And this is going to install Go. It also needs to install all the dependencies. And then after this is complete, I will have the Go command installed within this container. So now it has been downloaded and I just need to create a test app in the directory app main.go and I just pasted a list and surf application. So this is just an HP test server, go build go build main main.go. So this is the standard command. And then main, this starts the application. So this works. Main is the binary that has been created. Now I'm going to use a tool LDD, which will show me how it is dynamically linked. And you can see that main is linked to slash lib LD muscle x86. So if you would now copy this main to another Linux system and it would not have muscle version 1 x8664, then it will not work. It will say, I cannot find this library. So what you can then do if this is the case and we are not cross compiling yet, we are just creating a static binary, is to use this flag cgo enabled equals zero, go build o main no c go of main.go, ldd main no c go. And main no c go is not a dynamic program. So what happened now is that it's not dynamic, it's a static binary that can now be copied to other Linux systems. It's now not using c go anymore, so it does need to be linked. So CGO is also disabled if you cross compile. So if you do it again, go build main Darwin 64, which is for Mac, Intel based Macs. Then go operating system is Darwin and architecture is AMD 64. Then this will cross compile. What happens when I execute it? It doesn't know what to do with it because it's a binary of a different operating system and it also says it's not a valid dynamic program. So the defaults are most of the time okay. The only use case that I know of where you would need to put CGO enabled to zero is when you want to compile a binary that is still compatible even though it doesn't have the same C library on a different system. Otherwise if you're on the same system it's beneficial to have CGO enabled. So if you want to see a list of everything that you can cross compile, you can use the command go to this list and you can see here Darwin AMD64, the one that I just built, but you have also Darwin ARM64, for example, when you need to build for those ARM64 based MacBooks. You have Linux, a lot of Linux, different architectures. So you have AMD64, but you also have 32-bit, you have ARM, ARM 32-bit, ARM 64-bit. So you see you have a lot of different architectures that you could build for. And here, for example, you also have Windows.
So this was a brief introduction into cross-compiling and CGO. If you run into any problems cross-compiling, you can always send me a message directly or put something on the Q&A because there's a lot of cases where something could go wrong, but those cases are so specific that I cannot really cover them. This, what I just explained, is really the basics that you should know and that you can start from when cross-compiling for different operating systems and architectures. In this demo, I want to show you how to package your Go program in a Docker image. Once it is in the Docker image, you can launch it easily on any public cloud provider. Today, many SaaS applications are running based on Docker images. So it's very typical to ship your Golang program as a Docker image, probably running an HTTP server in most cases, and then you can launch it easily using a cloud provider or a VM running somewhere. So I'm going to show you how to build this test server using a Docker file. So first make sure you have Docker installed. You can just go to the Docker website and download it. I'm using Docker for Mac. There's also Docker for Windows. You can also download Docker for Linux. The only thing you really need to build a Docker image is a Docker file. And a Docker file is actually pretty easy to use. The first step is to say what your base image is. So I'm going to use from, and there's a Golang base image that you can use for compiling. So this is Golang 1.18, and I'm using Alpine Linux because it has a smaller footprint as an Ubuntu image. So it's very well fit to run Go programs on. Remember what I said in my previous lecture, if you are building for Linux, you need the same libc libraries. So if you're building using Alpine, you also need to be running Alpine. So here I have my build container. So from Golang Alpine as Go Builder, and here I have the runtime container. So this is the actual container that will run when I use Docker Run. Let's start with the build container. I have my base image that contains all the build tools. I have a word directory. So this is the directory that I will build everything in. This is slash app. I will copy everything from my local folder, this folder here, into the Docker container, into slash app, because that's my working directory. I then need to also add build tools, curl, git. So this can be necessary to build your executable. Most likely for this project, you only need git. You can just add some build tools. This container here, we will not ship, it's only for building. So it doesn't really exactly matter what you install as long as you have a runtime container that is separate where the build tools are not installed. So we add these build tools. APK add is a package manager in Alpine Linux. You then do a go build of the go files to the executable server. And this will be dynamically linked to this libmuscle C library because we are not cross compiling and we are not specifying to disable C go. These lines are not really necessary. It's just because I copy pasted them over from another project where we just want to clean up after every command. So then we have the runtime container. Runtime container is going to be Alpine, just the latest. So the C library needs to be the same. So we want to make sure that the C library in this one and this one are the same. Now this is the case, but if you get an error while executing your app, then you might have to change this latest into a specific version. It depends what Alpine Linux is being used for Golang 1.18. I also have a working directory slash app. I'm going to install CA certificates, which is not really necessary if you only have a server it's necessary when you want to make API calls. So if you make an API call to somewhere, you need CA certificates to be able to validate the server you're connecting to. So these are the root certificates. And then you can copy from the Go Builder, the app server and save it into app server. So this Alpine Linux will only have the CA certificates installed and the binary in slash app server. We'll always expose port 8080 in the container and then the entry point is slash app 
slash server. So that will be the process that starts when we start container. Let's try to build this. How do we build this? With docker build. Docker build. We are going to give it a tag, test server, and then we need to specify the path that we want to build, which is the current directory. And then you will see that the commands that we have listed in our Docker file will be executed. It will install Git and some dependencies, fetch our core dependencies, and then copy to our runtime container, the app server. So what is the image size of this Docker container? Let's have a look, Docker images, filter on test server, 812.8 megabytes. So it's pretty small. It will obviously become bigger once you start making more complicated Go programs and have more dependencies. How do we run this container? So you can either run it locally or on a cloud provider within Kubernetes or just with Docker on a VM. Docker run rm make sure that when I exit the container, the container is also removed. Interactive mode. Not really necessary, it's just that I want to hit Ctrl C once I want to exit. A port, so the port that is exposed within the container is 8080, but I also want to have it bind it on my local machine. And I'm going to run the test server, starting server on port 8080. Curl localhost 8080, the server is running. So that works. So we have a container running. We can also execute in this container to have a look in it. Docker exec, docker ps, first docker ps. Container ID is this one. Docker exec minus it for interactive mode. And I'm opening a shell. And then we are in the working directory app. App has a server, a binary is 6.5 megabytes and if i do ldd of the server you can see it is dynamically linked with our c library what if you want to get it even smaller that's also possible so i'll exit this and then i have a docker file scratch that i created so i'm going to close this one docker file scratch is very similar the build is exactly the same so this is all the same but instead of using a runtime container that is Alpine Linux, I have Scratch. And Scratch is a Docker maintained base image and there's really almost nothing in it. So from Scratch, we're gonna copy the app server and we are not really installing the CA certificates anymore because we don't have apk anymore, which means that we would have to also install CA certificates in our build image if you want to have it and then also do a copy from the CA path if you want to have the CA installed but because it's not really necessary to run a server I will just leave it like that just something to take into account docker build docker build minus t test server was our previous command so I'll call this test server scratch and then I want to specify the docker file because it's not a default docker file if you don't specify minus f then it will look for docker file if you specify minus f you can specify any file docker file scratch is the one i'm going to build and it's almost the same it will do the same build and it will just copy over the image to another runtime image so let's first try to run it docker run test server scratch Starting server on port 8080. Okay, that works. Now let's compare Docker images filter for test server. And we still shaved off some megabytes. So test server is 12.8 and our test server scratch is 6.7. So if you really want the minimum, then test server scratch is also a good runtime image. It kind of depends on what you prefer. If you still need to do debugging at some point on the runtime container, like while it is running, because something went wrong, 
then often you want Alpine Linux, a test server, and have maybe also curl installed. So here sometimes I also install curl and bash just so that I can do some debugging on the container itself while it is running if really something goes wrong. For example, you want to do a curl localhost on a specific endpoint to see if this is working. It's a little bit more difficult to debug with Scratch because there is almost nothing in it. So if you run our test Scratch again and we look for the Scratch image docker exec. So if we want to open a shell, then it will just say, I don't have a shell because bin sh is not installed. There is no shell because it's really a minimal container image. There is really nothing in it. So you cannot even enter in it with a normal shell. You would have to install it first before you would be able to do some debugging. You can still make it smaller, the image, if you want. There's also some flags that you can enter here, go build. You can remove debugging information, stuff like that, to get your Golang binary even smaller. If that really matters to you, then have a look at what flags are available. You can remove debugging information to get a smaller Docker image. Most of the time, I would say just using Alpine Linux already helps a lot in making sure that your Docker image stays small. So once you have a Docker image, you can really kind of deploy it everywhere you want. In this section, I'm going to talk about the AWS SDK. AWS stands for Amazon Web Services and is Amazon's cloud offering. In this section, we are going to use Go to make API calls to AWS. This is how it looks when you make an AWS API call. So AWS has multiple endpoints that you can reach. For example, EC2 is their virtual machine offering where you can launch virtual machines. So they will have a separate AWS endpoint for that. You can hit that endpoint over HTTPS and add parameters to call different actions. Every call needs to be authenticated. So you would also have to supply auth parameters. This makes it quite difficult to do these calls yourself. You could do them, for example, with curl or any other HTTP command line utility, or even with go, with the HTTP get that we did, we can do these API calls. As a response to your API call, you will then get a reply, as you see here at the bottom of our image. You then have to decode everything into a struct and every API call will have a different scheme. So you would have a scheme for every API call. There are thousands and thousands of API calls that you could make. So it would be quite a work to do this all by yourself. And that's why AWS has an SDK for Go that you can use and it will have functions in Golang, like describe regions that you can just call. And then this SDK will take care of authentication and will also parse the output for you. So it's quite a no brainer to use the SDK for endpoints like this. So what do we need to do? First, you need to open an AWS account if you don't have one already. We are then going to create an IAM user, download the credentials, and then we're going to configure these credentials on our machine using the AWS command line utility or as environment variables. So you can configure them straight into Visual Studio Code if you want, or you can use the AWS command line utility to configure them, and then you can use their command line utility together with the code that we're going to write. Let's start with configuring the AWS credentials of a user. If you don't have an AWS account yet, awsamazon.com, create an AWS account, and it will guide you through the steps to create an AWS account. Once you have your AWS account created, you can log in to the AWS account by signing in with your root account or with any administrator account. Then you will see a page like this one, very similar. We need to first create a user that we can use on our machine. So we're going to go to IAM. You can just type IAM, manage access to AWS resources. You go to users. 
add user username. We can call it go LOS SDK, for example. And we need an access key. Programmatic access enables an access key enables an access key ID and secret access key for the ALS API, command line utility and the SDK. So that's what we need. Permissions, you need to make sure that you have enough permissions to create an EC2 instance. So you can give it EC2 full access or just administrator permissions. You can click on attach existing policies directly. So we have here already policies created by ALS. The easiest is to give it administrator access, but there is also, for example, EC2 full access that you could use to start with. I'm going to start with administrator access because we will have other API calls to make as well. And then we can add text, which is optional, and then we can review. So we have the username go ALS SDK which is going to be administrator and we're going to get an access key. Make sure that you always protect these access keys. They're secret. Otherwise, someone else could create instances for you or take over your AWS account, especially when you create an administrator. This is the access key ID. So we can copy this and then we have the secret access key. So if you click here, then you can show the secret access key. It's also just a string. And this we need to configure. The easiest way to configure, I think, is to use the AWS command line utility. If you go to awsamazon.com slash CLI, then you can download the command line utility. So there's a Windows installer, macOS installer, and Linux installer to download this AWS command line to download this AWS command line utility. I will show you how to configure it with this CLI and how to configure it within Visual Studio Code. So you can pick either options. I would recommend the AWS command line utility, but if you cannot download it for any reason, then you can still configure it directly in Visual Studio Code. In Visual Studio Code, if you have the AWS command line utility installed, then you should be able to use AWS as a command line command. To configure your credentials, you can do AWS configure. And then it will ask for your ALS access key ID and your secret key. This is my access key ID, my secret key, and then you can specify a region, EU West 1, or if you are in the US, US East 1. Default output format, you can leave to none. And then it should be configured. If I do ALS STS, get color identity. It gives you the output and shows you that you are authenticated. So there is another way to do it. And that is to edit the launch configuration. So if you go back to the configurations here, you can add here an environment variable. And as an environment variable, you can add the environment variables necessary for AWS and then Visual Studio Code when you run this it will add these variables to the environment and then you will also be authenticated to your AWS account. There's three environment variables that you would typically configure AWS access key ID, AWS secret access key so this is the key ID and then the access key so these are the two that are supplied and then the ALS default region, which can be US East 1 or any other region that you would like to launch in. So these you can also configure within your launch configuration. If you then launch your Golang application with SDK, it will be able to call the ALS endpoints using this login information. In the next lectures, I will point out what part of the code will fail if you don't have your credentials properly configured. This is going to be our first ELOS SDK Colang demo. What you see here on screen is what we are going to build first. These are the steps that we need to take, the functions that we need to call to launch an EC2 on ELOS. 
the first step is going to be that we need to load the config. This will load the credentials, the ALOS access key ID and the secret key, whether it's in an environment variable or in a file. If you configured it with ALOS configure, then it's going to be in the file. Or if you even run it on an EC2 machine, it can be a role. So this load config is going to take care of that. And then we can do the EC2 API calls. First, we're going to do an API call to create an SSH key pair in case our SSH key doesn't exist yet. If it exists already, then we're going to skip that. Then we're going to find the Ubuntu AMI. There is an API call to list the available images. An AMI is an image. There is an Ubuntu image that we can search for, and that will then return AMI ID that we're then going to use to launch our EC2. Then we can say launch EC2 using this Ubuntu image as a base image to start our EC2 machine. And then when everything goes right, then we can output our instance ID, our EC2 instance ID. So let's get started on that. For this demo, I'm using a new directory, which I created and opened it in Visual Studio as a folder. I'm going to run go mod in it because now this will be important when we start using external modules. Let's start with a main function and then a function to create our EC2 instance. Func main, this will be the entry point. And we need two variables. We're going to output the instance ID, which is a string, and we're going to use error. So these two we need. And then we're going to call a function. We're going to call our create EC2 function. And this will then return our instance ID and our error. We don't really know what yet to pass. So let me just write these function signatures here. String and error is what we return. And then we return nothing yet. What do we do? We need to check for errors. So let me just add an if statement here. If error is not equal to nil, then we're going to say create EC2 error and then and then error message. And we're also going to stop. Let's we'll exit one. And if everything went fine, then we're just going to printf instance ID, which is this instance ID. And that's why we declared it a little bit higher up so that let's remove this column because it's not necessary so that the instance ID is assigned here, but declared here. So you can still use it here. Save this backslash N. Oh, I did return, but I'm not going to return anything. I'm just going to print it. And here I need to print it instead of RF. So we print this, we print this, and then it runs a create EC2. We want to maybe pass one thing. We want to pass the region, the AWS region, region, so we can easily change it. So I'm going to launch in US East 1, and I pass this, and now I can initialize the ALS SDK. How do I do that? It in the ALS SDK Go documentation. Let's have a look at it. AWS SDK for Go version 2 we are going to use. This is the GitHub repository. And you will find here the SDK documentation, but also you will find the getting started, for example. Here is the getting started. So the reference documentation is right here. So this is the developer guide with the getting started. And then you also find the services. Here's an example of the services with S3. There will also be an example of EC2, how to call them. So this is what you should read if you didn't have any idea how to get started. So let's just have a look at this getting started and then we'll get going. So we did a go mod in it. And then what you should do is go get, you need to go get these dependencies. These are external dependencies. So we are going to use config. 
using the SDK default configuration from the environment variables or the shared credentials or the configuration files. So this is what we need. I'm going to copy this and then we're going to change it a little bit. Config undeclared because we need this one. And then we'll add this as an external dependency. And it says could not import this config quick fix, go get. That was the command that you saw in the getting started. You can also run it within Visual Studio Code or you can run it in the terminal. What, we, what happened then? In go mod, you will now see that we are requiring this dependency. Once we start adding more dependencies, it will automatically add more to the go mod file. So this go get command adds dependencies, external dependencies to the go mod file. You will not find these internal dependencies because they just come with the go line. So the config now works. And now we have context, context. So we always need to provide a context with this load config. And context is something that is within go line. So context to do means that we are supplying an empty context which is fine, but what we also can do is we can pass this context if you want. And context can be useful in a way that it can contain variables, is a context variable, so it can contain extra variables. But more importantly, you could actually cancel a context, which means these API calls can take some time to execute if there's an API endpoint that is not working and it would just time out, it would take 30 to 60 seconds. This context allows you to cancel this whole flow in another point in your program. Right now, we are not going to use it, but we are going to pass it. So I'm going to say context and then I'm going to just define here context. CTX is context background. Background returns a non-nil empty context is never cancelled, has no values and has no deadline. So you could then change this context if there's a deadline or if it needs to contain values that you want to pass between the functions or if you want to cancel it later on. So we will use background and then we'll just pass it around to all our functions. This is of type context context. So then we have ctx context context. And then now we have context, config with region, and our region name. And now we can use this config. And then let's just return an empty string with fmtrf, enable to load SDK config. So what do we do next? We are going to initialize an EC2 client ec2 client equals ec2 dot and this is again something that we need to import now so we'll import service.ec2 i think it is it's somewhere in the help file service.ec2 ec2 and i would need to go get this go get and now it's downloading this service ec2 and now I'll be able to use it. New from config. So we can do EC2 new from config. So all these services are very similar. So if you use another service within AWS, you will also do a new from config. And you pass this config. And now we have an EC2 client. And this EC2 client we can use to do API calls. EC2 happens to be a really big package with lots of API commands. So it's very difficult to find in this list what exactly you need. So, but there's a trick. I always have a look at the AWS SDK to have to, to see what is available. It just gives you a starting point to see. So we need to create first this key pair. So we have create key pair. What do we need to pass to create key pair? Our context and the parameters. The parameters is of EC2 create key pair input so that we can supply input. So we have a context and then we need to reference this variable ec2 create key pair input and then there's options but they are optional key pair output and an error 
create key pair, create, and then we need to pass some variables. A key name. Let's pass a key name. Let's call it AWS Go Demo. AWS SDK Demo. Or Go AWS Demo. That's maybe a better name. And what do we see here? Cannot use. So we have a pointer string. Pointer string. So you could say oh, I want to do it as a reference, but that actually doesn't work. That's why AWS has some helper functions. I can use AWS string, and string will convert a string to a pointer string. We then need to go get AWS which I already have. So now I have AWS imported. If this shows an error for you, you still need to do go get or uh, you have to click and click on go get. So what is AWS string? Go to definition. String returns a pointer value for the string value passed in. So we pass a string and then it converts it to a pointer string and returns a pointer string. So just some helper functions. We have the same for a string slice, string map. It's because these AWS variables always expect, almost always expect pointers. So we have the key name. What's next on my list? I need to get the Ubuntu AMI image. EC2 client. And then if I just type image, what do we have? Create image, describe, Describe images. Let's have a look what describe images says. Describes the specified images, AMIs available to you or all the images available to you. Sounds like right. Describe images, context and parameters, but this time it's of easy to describe images input. So we pass the context, the easy to describe image input. And what do we need here? We need a filter, filters. And then we also would need the owner because the image that we are looking for is owned by Ubuntu. So we need to still find this owner ID, which we will find on ubuntu.com. It's somewhere described in the documentation. And we need these filters, these filters. So these are those of type filters. And now sometimes it gets a bit tricky because types.filter, it says in documentation here. But what is types.filter? Where can I find this types.filter? So that can be sometimes a bit annoying to find. Let's have a look. If we go to the definition, then types.filter. Right, it says github.com, service easy to types. So we can add it to our imports because otherwise it's difficult to find sometimes. Save this. Okay, now it's recognized. It's an array of name and values. So it's a filter. So if we have an array, then we need to do one more time curly brackets because this is one element in our array or in our slice. Name is name, we need to filter on the name. So we are going to say the filter name and then we have the filter value. So this just happens to be coincidence that it's name and name, but it's name refers to the name here, the name of the filter. And we're actually looking for the attribute within this describe images of name. Name, and again, it will a string because it needs to be a pointer here as well, and a comma at the end. Oh, this needs to be something else. It's a, a slice string. And what's going to be? We don't know yet. So there are multiple ways in finding, finding this. You can do this in the ALS web console. There is a describe images interface where you can type Ubuntu to find the correct filters. I'm just going to give you the filter. Once you know what the filter is, you can easily change it a little bit. You can change it a bit depending on your use case. So you can see Ubuntu images, HVM SSD, 
SSD, this HVM SSD is just a type of VM and then Ubuntu Focal. But you can see now that you can easily change this. If there's a new version of Ubuntu, you can change the name and the version. And that's how you would then find other versions. It's still showing values. Now it's showing properly. So again, if you log into your AWS account, go to EC2, then images or AMIs or find images, you can play around with that interface to, to find these. It's just some ADLS knowledge that you need to know to be able to filter images. There's another parameter that I want to add because we are going to ask ADLS to launch an HVM image. So I want to make sure that we filter only on HVM images. Could be a bit too much, but we just want to be sure. So this is going to be virtualization type and the value is going to be HVM, just so that we for sure have only images returned that are of type HVM within AWS. And then we need the owners. Owners is again a string, string slice, and this we need to find online, like I said. If I type Ubuntu AWS owner, then you have ubuntu.com, cloud images, and here it is explained that you can find images using using ALS commands or you can use it with a describe image but then you need the owner and this should be the owner 09972 and this we can then use there's also an interface here on this website there's an image locator that you can use so this is very similar to be able to find these AMI IDs. So what we are looking for is an AMI ID like this, and our API call will return this for us. So you also see this instance type, the version, the name. So we are basically filtering on that, plus then the owner. So that's what we need to input here, and this will give us an AMI ID. What is the output? Describe image output. Image output error. Oh, we are not catching our errors. So if you have an error, then we say create key pair error. And the error message. And if we have an error here, for example, if nothing was returned, then we can say describe image as error. Then we have the image output. And let's do some more checking. If image output images, which is of type images, which is a slice. So if this is zero, this slice, if the length of this slice is zero, then we also want to return that we didn't find anything. That means that something is wrong with our filter. Is empty. This was zero length. If it is not of zero length, we can take the first element of this slice, which is going to be the most recent one, the zero. And then this is going to be the image ID. So let's keep this for now. We need to now launch our image, launch our EC2. So EC2 client, launch, no, that's not it, run, run instances. So this API call is actually very old. It is already around for a very long time. You can see EC2 Classic, EC2 VPC. So it's definitely a very, a very old API call. EC2 run instances, context, and then EC2 run instance input. And what does it return? An instance and error, I guess. Let's have a longer look. Run instance output and an error. So let's already capture our error. Run instances error. And then if we have our instance ID, instance, instances, first element, and then the instance ID. So we need to do another check. And this is gonna be also a pointer because that's how illus returns it. So every time you're assuming that there is a first element, make sure that you check it. So if len, of instances is zero, then we are going to say 
instance instances is of zero length. And then we need to provide our run instance input. So there's a lot of input here that we can supply. First of all, our image ID. Our image ID is this image ID right here from our image output. Our key pair, and it's just a key name. So we can just say key name. And we just reuse the name itself. That should work. And then what else do we have? There's a min count and a max count that you always have to supply. But it also needs to be a pointer. So we're just going to use alias int32 as a helper function. Key name, image ID. And then we also need a type. It's going to be an instance type. What type of instance I'm going to launch? A T2 micro, T3 micro, or something else? We can again use the types package. And here everything is declared. So if I just type T3 micro, instance type T3 micro, which gives you a very small image, but it's within the free tier. So if you just opened your alias account, you have a free tier, so you don't have to pay for it. Just make sure that you shut it down after you tested it, that it works. So that's it, I think. If you're going to run this multiple times, what's going to happen then is that it's going to say my key pair already exists. So I want to capture that as well, but we don't have to really capture it straight away. We will test it first. What is happening here? I don't need any output, so let's remove this variable. We are launching an US East 1. Okay, I think we are ready to test this. Maybe it will just crash, and then we'll have to fix something, but we'll see. First of all, let me run this, and I haven't configured any AWS credentials. Just to show you what the output would be. Go run go. And then we actually loaded the default config, but then failed to retrieve credentials, failed to refresh cache credentials, no easy to IMDS role found, operation error. So it tries to fetch these credentials using something, but there are no credentials. So what if I pass some credentials, alias access key ID, ABC and it was secret access key XYZ. So now I pass credentials, but they're not valid. So I get status code 401 because there are credentials, but there's still not authentication failure because they are not correct. So I'm going to configure my credentials on my machine and then I'm going to run this go run. So either you run the ALS command line utility to have it configured globally, or you configure it in Golang itself, in Visual Studio Code itself, but then you have to use the run and start debugging or run without debugging to have Visual Studio Code load these environment variables. I have configured my credentials now. I'm gonna run it again. Oh, and it works. Instance ID is returned and let's have a look at my ALS console. So this is the ALS console. I went to EC2 right here, clicked on it, and then you have instances on the left that you can click. It opens with a dashboard, but then you can click on instances. And then you can refresh a few times. And now you can see it is initializing. This is my instance ID. And here's my instance. And I have an Ubuntu AMI. Here's Ubuntu. Here's the AMI ID. Ubuntu Focal. And then we have the key pair name Go ALS Demo. So you could actually log into the instance. If you want to try to log into your instance using SSH, then have a look at your security group because your security group will be default. And what you want is that you can actually log in with your IP address. Because we don't have any security groups applied, you might have to edit this. So if you click on this security group and then you do 
edit inbound rules, then you might have to add a rule for SSH and you can type here your IP address or you can just open it to everywhere. If you type your IP address, it's going to be a 32. So if your IP address is 1, 2, 3, 4, then you need to add a slash 32. 0, 0, 0, slash 0 opens it to anywhere. For SSH, if you want to open everything, you can just say all TCP. So I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to log in at this point. But just for your information, if you want to be able to log in using SSH, that's how you should do it. So it's initializing now. Let's just delete it. We don't need it. Terminate. So make sure that you terminate always your instance so it doesn't keep on running. Otherwise, you will start incurring costs if you run more than one T3 micro outside the free tier. If you are still in the free tier, you will not incur charges for the T3 micro. But if you are running multiple ones, you will you will get charged. It just depends how many hours in a month that you run it. I think you have something like 730 hours for free or something. There's a page on Alewest that describes you in detail how these work. So this is already shutting down. So what do I want to explain you now? Well, if I do it again, the go run.go, it's going to say create key pair error. There's a duplicate. It already exists. How would you solve that? Well, we only need to create the key pair if the key pair doesn't exist. So there's also an easy to describe key pair, easy to client describe key pairs. There's a context, easy to describe key pairs input, and this outputs the key pairs and error. Describe key pairs error. What do I want as input? I want key name. So by default, it describes everything. But I just want to have key names. And then this is the string slice. I think it is. My key name is go ls demo. And then if it exists, then if len key pairs, key pairs, what is this? Yeah, key pair info. If it's zero, if the output is zero, then I want to create my key pair. And actually, there's something else that I forgot because where is my key pair? Where is my private key? I still should output my private key. Otherwise, I cannot log into my machine. So new key pair or just key pair is going to be here. And what I want is I want to output it key pair. What does it have? Key pair. Okay, now I need a colon key pair dot key material is a string. And that's my PEM encoded file. And I should write this out to the current directory so that I have my key available. How do I do that? There's another function for that, os write file. Write file writes data to a named file, creating it if necessary. I'm going to call it go as ec 2 pem file, and then it's a byte. So I need to convert my key material, which is a string pointer, to a byte. So something like this. So I dereference it so it becomes not a pointer anymore when I put this star sign before it. So now it's a normal string that is being passed to the byte array. So now it becomes a byte array or a byte slice. And then write file and then permission. So permissions, if I give it 0600, then it should only be readable and writable by the owner. So that's the best to do for something like a private key, so nobody else can read it. What is the output of this? An error. So I will just say error. Write file error if something goes wrong. So what am I missing? Don't think that I'm missing anything. 
So let's go run it again. Okay, that works. But what if I delete my key file because I don't have my private key, so I still need to delete my key file. And then I'm sure that another error will pop up that we still need to fix. Let's first delete our instance. Then let's go to our key pairs. Key pairs are here. It, and here we have to go LOS demo, action delete. So yeah, once you created the key pair, it didn't save your private key. There's no way to retrieve it. We have to delete it and then recreate it. Otherwise we will never be able to log into our instance. Although just for completeness, there are other ways to log into an EC2 instance nowadays. If you don't have an LOS key pair, there's still something called the LOS session manager that you could use to log into an instance. So clear, go run. Uh -huh. Another error. Describe key pairs, but our key pair is not found. So we return an error, describe key pairs. It says an API error occurred that we have the error invalid key pair not found because we were asking for this go LOS demo key pair to describe it, but it's not there. So it just gives us an error. How to solve that? There are ways to filter on this invalid key pair not found using a type in Golang with the ALS SDK. But I was looking and within this ALS Go, ALS SDK Go V2, if you check the types, there is actually no type for this error. So there is another package that you could use. If you want to know more about it, you can search for ALS SDK Go V2 and then error handling. It will explain you how you can handle errors. So I'm going to do something that is a little bit more straightforward, but maybe not the best way to do it. But I don't think we will ever have issues doing this. So what I'm going to do is if the error is not nil, but we can only enter this conditional, we can only return this error if the string does not contain so this error is basically just a string if it does not contain this statement. String, strings. So if not contains invalid key pair not found. It's a little bit ugly, but I found an open issue in GitHub that documentation is not completely up to date for the V2 Golang SDK for AWS and that not every single type is available. So there is a solution for it. There is a package that you can use, but that package might change over time. So this is code that should keep on working when you want to try out this demo. So if there is if there is something better that comes out in the future, I will update my code in GitHub. But for now, I think this should be fine. So let's have a look. Go run go. Oops, another error. <laughs> and and this is always when you when you start coding against this ALS SDK, there are things happening that you just don't anticipate you always have to check a lot how certain variables are returned and there's also tests that you can write. So now I'm checking for this string contained. So we didn't go to, so we didn't go to this error, but then what happened? Line 44, the length of this key pairs and key pairs is just not initialized. Key pairs is a pointer which is not initialized always. So here we have to check if key pairs equals nil or the length is zero. So if it's not defined, then we probably got an error here and the error could have been invalid key pair. If it was really an error, we return an error. If it was not really an error, but just not found, then we enter here and then we check if the key pair is nil. If the key pair is nil, or the key pair is defined and we the length was still zero, then we're going to create this key pair. And this should work. Go run go. And it created another instance. So back to our instances. 
So this is the third one we created now, and then we can terminate it. We don't need it. Successfully terminated. So we clean this up nicely. And that should be it. So we have our main function, define our context. So we could we could have deadlines here in case it takes too long that we stop our program, for example. But we don't have anything, so we just apply an empty context. Create EC2. Create EC2 will load the configuration. We need to make sure that we have the environment variables. We will, from the config, create this EC2 client. Describe key pairs. If it doesn't exist the key pair, we're going to create a key pair. Ah, and then we didn't check whether we have the output file. And here we have the output file, which should be our private key. So if you want to SSH to the machine, you can either use putty on Windows or the SSH command. SSH command is going to be SSH minus I of the go AWS PAM file. And then the login is always Ubuntu on these type of machines and the IP address. And then you should be able to log in. Create key pair, write file that worked. Then we describe the image. The image outputs an AMI ID, and this AMI ID we're going to use here. So specify the key name, instance type, and we're only going to launch one instance. And then we're going to return the instance ID, and then we output the instance ID. So that should be it to launch an AWS EC2 instance. In this demo, I want to show you how to upload a file to S3. But before we can upload a file to S3, we'll have to create a new S3 bucket. So let's get started on that. It's going to be very similar as the last demo. We just need to do a few things different. So this load config, I'm going to make a function for that. I'm going to call this function init s3 client. And we're still going to have the region, which is string. And the reason why I'm going to do this is that we're going to split up our functions. We're going to have multiple functions where we need the s3 client. If we had multiple functions where we would need the ec2 client in the previous lecture, then I would also have done it like that. So the s3 client is going to initialize a config. We're going to return an error, and what else? We're going to return the S3 client as well. And the S3 client is going to be S3 client is going to be, well, this needs to be nil for sure, but what does it need to be? S3 dot new from config and then CFG. And new from config replies replies then this s3 client so we need to also pass a context so we have ctx context context and then the region so this we still need to import go get so now we have the service s3 this is now imported new from config what does it reply an s3 client so that's okay but we also need to reply that we don't have an error and then init s3 client s3 client so we would need to declare it here s3 client is of type s3 client init s3 client or s3 client equals an error equals init s3 client the context and the region will be us east one and then we're going to make it if for that if s3 client if error is not equals to nil then we're going to return something fmt printf init s3 client error and the explanation and then we need to define our error here as well s3 client is declared but not used so i think we are good for now we just need to write another function and write our function create s3 bucket and we're also going to supply the context 
But what else? We're going to supply the S3 client. S3 client. And we can return an error. And then we just can copy paste this a little bit here. Oh, and here we need an OS exit one. And here we also need an OS exit one. So we're going to create an S3 bucket. And we need the S3 client for that. S3 client. Save this, create S3 bucket. And then it just replies the error. So we have no errors now. Just that we have to return nil here. And I think we're all green. We're all green. So create a new bucket, S3 client. Create bucket. That's an easy one. Supply the context. Supply the S3 create bucket input. And then we need to give the name, the bucket name. Bucket is the bucket name. A less string. Let's define bucket name for that. So the bucket needs to be unique in AWS. So that means that if I create a bucket, bucket name, AWS demo test bucket, then if you're going to execute this lab, it's going to say this bucket already exists because I created it, because it needs to be unique. So I would say add a random string here, like something like, something like this. And then if everyone that does this demo adds a unique string, it will always be unique. Oh, so I saved this alias string bucket name and then what happened here is it imported the older ELS SDK. Because if you use the older SDK previously, then sometimes Visual Studio can remember, but it's actually the wrong one because this one is the V1 and we need V2. It is possible that you're going to implement something using a service that is not completely implemented in V2 or a feature that is not completely implemented in V2 and then you still have to use the V1. But in general, you should use v2 and i hope v3 never comes out otherwise i would have to redo all these lectures <laughs> create bucket and then there is a lot of explanation here and why is there a lot of explanation here because again s3 exists already for a long time has lots of features and there is a possibility that you will get an error depending on what region you are using by default, the bucket is created in the US, US East, North Virginia region. You can optionally specify a region in the request body. You might choose a region to optimize latency, minimize cost, and so on. For example, if you reside in Europe, you will probably find adventures to, to create a bucket there. And then you might have to specify something else. So let's just execute this and see how far we get. If I do go run.go it seems to have created the bucket there's no error how can i know that it was s3 ls of this test bucket let's try that okay no error that means it has been created good let's just see if i would create this in europe eu last one just gonna give it another name, if that would work. And if it doesn't, I will have to change something. Okay, that seems to have worked as well. No such bucket, EU West one. Oh, oh, I already see what is happening here. I need to specify error. And I don't really need output. So the first time it actually worked, the second time it didn't work. So I'm gonna say create bucket error. And let's see. Let's see what we get back as an error when we run our Golang program in US1 on this bucket. Create bucket error. 
the unspecified location constraint is incompatible for the region specific endpoint this request was sent to. So yeah, with S3 buckets that are not created in US East 1, you might have some issues and that's why I wanted to cover all the use cases here. If you're gonna create a bucket in another region, then US East 1, you will need to add something. Let's try to fix that. So what do we have here? Create bucket input. Create bucket input configuration of types create bucket configuration. Types create bucket configuration. And then you see now it's S3 types and not EC2 types anymore. And what do we have here? Location constraint. Specify the region where the bucket will be created. If you don't specify a region, the bucket is created in the US East region. So we also want to specify location constraint. And this is of times bucket location constraint. And what is this? A string. So we can add a region here. And then we just need to pass the region again here. Region string. And then we just add the region here as well. Okay, maybe I should make the region a constant. Uh, why not? Region, region name, EU West 1, because we're using it in multiple places. And then I don't have to pass it anymore. Region name, remove this, remove this. And then region name, and it should work. And let's now see whether we can create a bucket in a different region. Seem to have worked. And this doesn't give an error. All good. So I'm not going to use this bucket here. I'm going to use this first bucket in US East. So let me just bring this back to US East one. So we created our bucket, but we only have to do this once. Then again, we can do a describe bucket or list bucket to check whether this bucket already exists. So how do you do that? S3 client list bucket or describe bucket. There is no describe bucket, so it will need to be list buckets. What does list bucket say? It returns a list of all buckets owned by Authenticate Sender. That should work. List bucket. And then S3 list bucket input. What's going to be our input? There's no input. It is going to list all the buckets. Uh, all buckets error. And then we will return an error. For example, these errors can still be a hit, as in we can still have an error if you don't have permissions for it. And that's what it says here. You will need to, you will need to S3 list all my buckets permission to be able to do this. And then we need to say, did we find the bucket? We'll start with false. And then we need to iterate over all these buckets. So let's have a look. Mm, range all buckets dot buckets. All buckets is the variable, but in all buckets you have buckets, which is of types bucket. And then this will be then a bucket of types bucket. And if we have bucket name, we can compare the name, which is string. It's a pointer, so we need to make sure that we compare the actual name. So that's why we need a star. Otherwise, we are comparing the addresses. If bucket name equals to bucket name, which is our static variable, then font is true. If not found, then we're going to create this new bucket. And otherwise, we're just going to return nil. Oops. Let's see if that works. Save. Go run. And that seems to have worked. And we still have our bucket. We still have our bucket. Let's upload something now. now. We are going to pass this S3 client to another function. Upload to S3 bucket. And then you're going to say upload to S3 bucket error. If we have an error, 
Let's make a new function. Upload to S3 bucket and return nil if you have no error. Okay, do we have still errors? No, no errors. What do we need to do to upload something to S3? We need our S3 client. And if you just type upload, then you see upload part. Uploads a part in multi-part upload. That's a really low level function. So this is not something that we are going to use. Amazon actually has other functions available for us to upload data to S3 with higher level functions. So that we have to do less. If you have a specific use case and you cannot use those other functions, those high level functions, then you would have to use those. But for us, for a simple use case of uploading a simple file, github.com elvis feature s3 manager so we're gonna get this package manager and then once it's imported you'll be able to use it manager dot take some time to import it if it takes long time you can see if there's no errors And it seems GitHub was just a bit slow. So now it's imported. Manager, and what does it say? If I type upload, new uploader. New uploader creates a new upload instance to upload object in S3. And this we should be able to use. New uploader. And we need to pass our client, S3 client. And this will give us a new uploader uploader equals manager new uploader and then we can upload something to s3 with our high level function within the uploader package what do we have here upload uploads an object to s3 context and then s3 put what was that put object input put object input and that should be it. And this will give us an output. The output we probably don't need. It will return things like bytes, output, and stuff like that. So we just need an error. If there's an error, then we say upload error. What are we going to supply? The key, the bucket. The key is just a file name. And the body. And the body is of IO reader, which we have used previously. And do we need something else? We might need something else. For example, if you want to make an object public, you can add permissions, but we don't really need it now. So I'm going to keep it simple. Bucket is a bucket name. Convert it to a pointer. Prefix is going to be the name of the file. So this can be a directory as well. So it can be directory slash test.txt something like that and it will automatically create this directory because there's not really directories that exist in s3 just a prefix this doesn't seem to work unknown field prefix key key is a name so a directory is called a prefix but it wants key and then the body of it so the body can be you can maybe read a file first with the IO package to read a file, or we can just say, I'm going to create a new buffer, a new reader, which gives us a strings reader, which implements this IO reader interface. And it will just say, hello world. So this also works. If you want to read from a file, you can also use the IO util read file. This reads from a file. If you want to read from a file, a local file. We are using strings new reader, which gives us this body, and then it should upload a file. Let's have a look. We can output upload complete, just so that we know the program executed. Upload complete. Let's hope that it's now in our bucket. And there is our test.txt. Let's copy it locally to see if it worked. 
And then you can also use the Ilves web console if you want to download the file with the browser or you can just read it here, hello world or on the console. This command will only work on Linux or Mac OS. It just outputs the file, hello world. So our upload of our test.txt with our text hello world worked. So in this demo, I uploaded a file to S3 and I did it with a little bit of text. I'm sorry if I'm going a little bit quick over this demo, but a lot of this code is just boilerplate code because you can see that it just this piece of code that is new and this piece of code is new. And then here it is on for loop, but you can see that there's a lot of boilerplate code involved to do these illness calls. I can still show you one more thing. I can show you if we want to upload a file that is from our local drive. So like I said, this IO util, we can use read file and the file name is test.txt and it returns bytes and an error. So test file error. And then if we cannot read the file, we'll given read file error. And then we have a test file, which is bytes. So what do we do then? We remove first this colon and then bytes new reader, bytes new buffer. Oh, there's new reader as well. New reader or new buffer? It's new reader. New reader from bytes test file. So this gives us a reader. Reader implements the interface IO reader. So this should also work. Go run, upload complete. Let's now call it test2.txt to see if the file matches. And yes, it is now a hello world with three explanation marks, just like I had it here in the test.txt. So if you have a local file that also works, if you do an API call like HTTP get, and then you get the full body and then you upload it to S3, that also works. So where your source file comes from, that doesn't really matter. As long as you can give an IO reader, which can also stream this data because it's a reader interface, then you'll be able to upload a file to S3. If you want to delete your bucket afterwards, there will also be an S3 client delete bucket. If you want to delete your bucket manually afterwards, then you can do ALS S3 delete bucket. ALS S3 delete bucket. And you can also do it over the interface. And ALS S3 RM can remove the file. So if I do this, then the file is gone because you will be charged for storage, for get requests and put requests. If you are in a free tier, you have some free usage as long as you stay within the limits. But even then, if you have to pay for it, it's really only a few cents as long as you keep your files very small. So that's it for this demo. So we uploaded a file into S3 and we created a S3 bucket. Now that we uploaded a file to S3, let's try to download it. Next to our upload to S3 bucket, we're going to have download from S3 going to pass the S3 client and most likely you will get back the contents, which is going to be of bytes. So I'm just going to call it out and I'm going to say download complete and I'm going to output it. And we just have to write this function. So out byte is how we typically transfer file contents with a slice of bytes. Download from S3, same signature as upload from S3. So I'm just going to copy paste this function and I'm going to call it download from S3. What I'm going to return is also byte. It's very small files, so I can just return the contents in one variable. I will then 
return empty bytes so that everything is green. We have here the new uploader manager. There is a new downloader. This new downloader accepts the S3 client and returns a downloader. Downloader equals this manager new downloader and then we should be able to initiate a download function. Download and context and a writer at. This writer at will be a buffer. We just then need to provide a variable of the writer at interface and that will be the actual content of our file that we want to download. We will provide a variable of the writer at interface and the downloader will then download the contents of this file of S3 into this buffer. S3 get object input. And this returns N and R. The N in 64 returned is the size of the object downloaded in bytes. I'm going to call this numbinds and then the error. If we have an error, then we say download error. And then we just need to define this buffer. Buffer equals manager new write at buffer. So they have a function we can use that returns a manager write at buffer and implements this writer at. We just need to provide an initial buffer, which we can just do by providing an empty byte. And then we can return here the buffer. And if you return the bytes, it will return a slice of bytes written to the buffer. So this just returns all the bytes that are in this buffer. So download will put everything in this buffer and we will output the buffer. And if there's nothing to output, we can just output nil. We would still need to whether the num bytes matches the bytes in our buffer, just to be sure that we download it properly. If num bytes equals to the length of buffer bytes, and if we give this a variable, then we can nicely give an error code with the correct variable. Num bytes received equals this length of the buffer bytes that we received and if then the num byte is not equal to the num byte received then we're going to throw an error num bytes received doesn't match and then we can just output it num bytes and num bytes received num bytes is in 64 and num bytes received is int so need to make sure that we are comparing the same things we can just say that our int needs to convert to in 64 first so that we can convert to the num bytes so what are we doing here downloading checking for errors checking for num bytes and then returning the actual bytes what are we downloading? That's what we need to provide here still. Get object input, a bucket and a string. Bucket, you can just copy it from here actually. Bucket and the key. Save this. And then download complete. Here we output it. Okay, let's have a look whether this works. Go run. Go file, upload complete, there's this one, download complete, there's this one, and it's the hello world. So the hello world that we uploaded here from our test.txt. So if we now change it 
this is a change, then it should first upload this change and then download this change. Okay, that also seems to work. So our upload and download seems to be working. Also, when you upload something to S3 and it already exists, it is going to override it. So that's why we are not seeing an error. It first overrides it and then it downloads it again. And we see that we can download something from S3 and output it. That's it for this demo. We have a simple upload and simple download function to write and read to and from S3. Now that we have completed our AWS upload and download in S3, let's also have a look how we can write tests for our new code. I'm going to create a new file, main test.go. And what you could actually also do is you could move those functions to s3.go and then have s3test.go. That is probably a little bit more clean than what I'm doing. Package will still be main. Um, let's test our create s3 bucket. Test create s3 bucket. T, testing T, save. Testing is imported. And then we want to call our create S3 bucket with a context and S3 client. Context background is a good one. Create S3 bucket error. If error is nil, not nil, let's just exit. Create S3 bucket error. context and then now this s3 client we don't really want to make real s3 calls in our testing so we will have to write another mock s3 client what should our mock s3 client implement it should implement this list bucket and create bucket how did we do that last time last time we created an interface and now we will have to do the same so list buckets is a function that we'll have to implement in our interface. So let's make a new type, our S3 client, which is an interface, and it will have these two functions that we are going to use, list S3 bucket and create S3 bucket. And then we can change our function signatures, create S3 bucket, get the S3 client, and that should work. You can also return it here, but then we are going to get into some trouble if we are going to pass it to our upload S3 bucket. So let's just change it here, do the test, and then I will continue explaining how we do the other functions. S3 client, if I save this, this should be still working. Looks okay. Test create S3 bucket. And then we can create our mock client. So we're gonna have type mock S3 client. This is gonna be a struct. And then it's, this struct will have these two functions. List bucket and create bucket. This is going to be a function m mock s3 client twice, and then we just need to create a function, and then we have the list. Then we have the list bucket output that we want to return, and the create bucket output. So we can just like last time, we can say s3 list or just list bucket output and this is of s3 list bucket output and create bucket output and this is of s3 create bucket output and then when we return we return m dot list bucket output and no error and here we return the create bucket output list buckets output yeah, that's better. And then here we'll pass our mock S3 client. What buckets are we going to output? 
we can output buckets of times bucket will this times bucket be imported probably not let's copy it from here this is going to be times bucket buckets oh i need a colon here comma here another comma here and then we can say the name is test bucket and then it will still create our name is undeclared oh yeah it's a slice so we need to add one element so this is one element if you want to have two elements it's going to be like that test bucket two let's add two elements and this will test our for loop here create bucket so we, it, this will test our font and then we'll have the create bucket output of s3 create bucket output and will we have anything in here location but we're not using it so you can just leave it empty as is let's put a breaking point and let's have a look let's first run it without debugging okay it runs let's now have a look with the debugging so font is false and actually what i wanted is i wanted to go in this okay so we are comparing all the buckets and in buckets we have two buckets our test bucket and our test bucket too so this is how we can test our logic after an api call and then we create a bucket and this returns no error the error is nil and then we succeed so this is how we can test api calls and this we can do for every every api call to aws that we make there's just one slight problem with our upload to s3 bucket because we are passing the s3 client and then here we are initializing our new uploader so this ideally we would like to get out of the upload to s3 bucket and then we don't have to pass the s3 client we can then pass the uploader and if you pass the uploader we can then implement an interface for our s3 uploader so the way we would do it is type s3 uploader interface upload and we would also have a street downloader interface and there we put the download and then we would change this into a street uploader actually no one second we would first change this uploader is the s3 uploader and then we don't need this anymore so we'll just take it away but we still need to pass the uploader and the uploader we can pass like this because the new uploader implements those two functions or this one upload function and we can do the same for the downloader so we can say here manager new downloader s3 client and then here down we can say the downloader is of s3 downloader and then we can also implement tests save this and then there's still one problem we are doing a read file and we could just pass for example the file name because when we want to test it we might still want to read a file but we might have another path to the read file so i'm going to take this away file name here as well file name and pass this right here 
test.txt and here if we want to create an uploader we have to make a type s3 mock s3 uploader which is a struct implement this upload method m mock s3 uploader and this gives the upload output upload output return upload m upload output and nil is it nil yeah it's an error save this and then when we create another function test upload to s3 testing what is it called download from s3 upload to s3 bucket test upload through s3 bucket it doesn't need to exactly match but it's nice to have it exactly match and what do we need to pass context uploader and file name so here in our files we could then make a new folder test data and in test data we could have a new file test.txt this is a test file and it's not not going to really upload but it's going to read it upload to s3 bucket context can be context background and the uploader is going to be our mock uploader and then we have a file name which is going to be test data test.txt let's call this mock uploader and then we're going to define the mock uploader right here what is going to be in the mock uploader upload output upload output we're not really checking for it so it can be empty upload output needs to be of manager upload output and it returns a location upload id but if we are not really checking on it if we are not really checking on it we don't really need to output anything we're just going to check if we have no errors if we have no errors then our test was successful if errors not equals to nil then we have an error of the upload s3 bucket we're not testing a lot of code here but you could potentially have a lot of other code here in bigger applications where you're going to do an upload and you want to test your whole flow so right now it's just a small function but you can easily see that it could get bigger let's put a breaking point now the file name is test data test.txt and we read the data and in test file we now have this is a test file and we have the bytes in there which we are going to upload and the upload returned nil if we wanted we could still write some more tests in our list bucket or create bucket or our upload to see if the arguments passed are correct for example the put object input is this we could test basically on this where we are supplying a body if you want to write more evolved tests so this is how you typically test aws endpoints you write a mock uploader or a mock client for every service that you are using and then you make sure that you pass this to your function and as long as you implement the correct interfaces then within the function the client will always be able to do an upload or a download a list bucket or create bucket and then you can mock these functions in your testing file in this section i'll be covering microsoft azure i will show you how to use the azure go sdk to execute api calls on microsoft azure what do we need to do before we can use the azure go sdk first you need to create an azure account if you haven't done already and you will have to download the azure command line utility then you can run az login which will authenticate you in the browser 
and then the credentials will be configured in your home directory in the Azure directory. So Azure stores a token in this .azure directory in your home, and then when you use the Azure Go SDK, it can then load these credentials from a token file in the directory and can then use the Azure API. In our first lecture, we want to create a virtual machine on Azure to show how the SDK works. To be able to create a virtual machine, we have to go through a few steps. The first step will be to create SSH keys. And I actually have a separate lecture on how to create SSH keys. So we are just going to use the code that already exists as a library in my GitHub repository. If you want to know the details about creating SSH keys in Go, you can have a look at that separate lecture. Then we're going to initialize the SDK, retrieve the token from our config, the token that has been stored by the Azure command line utility, and then we can start creating resources on Azure that are necessary to create RVM. First, we need a resource group, which is just a logical grouping, so that's pretty easy to create. We can then create the public IP, the VNets, the subnets, and a network security group. We can then create a network interface that we can attach to this newly created virtual machine. So then this newly created virtual machine will then have a public IP address that we can then contact and SSH into it. To be able to SSH on port 22, we also need to create a network security group. So the network security group can allow access to port 22 based on an IP address, or it can also just allow all access on port 22 so that we can test our newly created instance. That's what we are going to do in our first Azure Go SDK lecture. The first step before we can use the Azure Go SDK is that we need to install the Azure CLI if you haven't done already. So I just typed in Azure CLI in Google and one of these Microsoft.com links, the first one here, will bring you to the correct website to be able to download this Azure CLI. So here are the instructions to install it on Windows, on Mac, on Linux. So if you are on Windows, you can just download the latest release or you can download a specific version. On Mac, the easiest is to use Brew. So I installed Azure CLI with Brew. Once installed, you should have the AZ command available. And the first thing you have to do is to use AZ login. So if you open a new terminal, then you can type AZ login and AZ login will open your browser where you can then log in to your Azure account with your Azure credentials. This is how it looks like. You'll be able to pick an account if you already have set up one or you can use another account. And then once you give your credentials, it will say you have logged into Microsoft Azure and then you can close this window. So make sure that you have opened an Azure account first and then you just have to log in and then the Azure command line utility will have saved the credentials in your home directory. Once your credentials are set up, you can use the AZ command to check whether your credentials are set up correctly. So if you use a command like AZ account list, it should output you a list of accounts that are available. So if this command works and you don't get an error, your credentials are set up correctly on your own machine. Let's get started with our Azure instance demo. I'm going to try and create a virtual machine on Azure using the Azure Go SDK. First thing I did is I did a Go mod init of the Azure instances, and I already put a little bit of code in place, just three functions the generate keys function, the get token function, and the launch instance function. So the generate keys is the only function that has some code in it, the other two have nothing in it yet. So what is this generate keys? This generate keys is going to use this SSH demo code to generate a private and a public key. So whenever we're going to launch our instance, we are going to create a mykey.pem and a mykey.pub. So a private and a public key. Going to write this in this current directory, and then we're going to return the public key as a string. This we then need to 
large instance because we're going to launch the instance with our public key. So we don't really have to worry how to generate these keys. These keys will be generated by this piece of code. If you want to know how this SSH generate keys works, there's a separate lecture on SSH that you can have a look at. The next step is to get the token, the Azure token, so the initializing of the Azure Go SDK to get us a token that we can do API calls with. This we still need to write, and then we can try to launch the instance. So first we need to create a resource group, then all these other resources, and then finally the virtual machine can be launched. So let's try to get started. I will first write this get token, try to execute that, see if we get an error, and if we don't get an error, we can start with a launch instance. So how do we initialize the token? Well, maybe let's have first a look at the Azure SDK. Let's Google for the Azure Go SDK. So here's the Azure SDK for Go on GitHub. So here's a lot of information about the Azure SDK. It says you can find the library folders grouped in a service called the SDK directory, and you need Go 1.18 or later because they are using generics. And then there's also older packages that you can use, but you don't need to use if there would be something that is not implemented in this newer SDK. So if you have a look at SDK, here we have an AZ core, AZ identity, and the resource manager. So these are all packages that we can use. Let's have a look at this AZ identity. The Azure Identity Client module for Go provides Azure Active Directory token authentication. So we will have to start with that. What do you need? An Azure subscription, which you should have, it should be authenticated and go 1.18. Here it is also explained what type of credentials you have, how you can get your credentials through the environment or through a managed identity. If you're on an Azure host, then you have a managed identity. We are not on an Azure host, so we want to use the command line utility. So let's have a look which one would be best for us. And here we see, for example, this new Azure command line interface credential. So now that we have the command line interface installed, we can then use this command to retrieve a token from our stored directory. And we also need to do the go get of this AZ identity. So let's try that out. This is our get token, AZ identity, and then the go get. It is downloading. Let's handle our this error. Return the error. And then otherwise we'll return the token. I am returning here a string, but I'm not going to return a string. I'm going to return whatever this credential is returning. So this has been downloaded. Save this. AZ identity returns an Azure command line interface credential options. No, it returns the Azure command line interface credential. So let's see. But what do we need to actually invoke this API? We can have a look what we need to know what we have to return here. Whether we return a string, if you do a get token, or whether we return this whole variable. Let's output right now an empty string. And then we can see when we are going to launch our instance, when we are going to create our first resource, what exactly we need, because then it will be more clear. So I'm just going to save this and I'm already going to run it to see if this new Azure command line interface credential actually works. So as I do go run, okay, that seems to work. My key has been created and this get token was executed. No error so far. If you get an error, there's probably something wrong with your credentials. If you don't get an error, your credentials should be good. Let's now have a look. So we did the generate keys, get token. We are, we are just sending an empty string because we don't really know exactly what we need in our launch instance. But let's try to do the first step of our launch instance, 
creating the resource group to see what exactly the type is that we need. And I will tell you why I don't want to put the exact type here, because here we have the Azure command line interface credential. And that seems to me a variable that is not abstract enough. It should just be an Azure credential rather than the Azure command line interface credential. And once we start using the functions to create resources, we will see what type that we need. So let's start with the launch instance function. So remember the graph that I showed you in the previous lecture. The first step is to create a resource group, a logical grouping within Azure. So this AZ identity we did, let's go and have a look in SDK. And the resource group is part of the resource manager. So if you click on the resource manager, you will see that everything that is managed by the resource manager in Azure will be right here. There is also a reference documentation where you can potentially more easily search for things. But then here, if I look for resource, resources, then within resources, we have the ARM resources. And this ARM resources can create for us a resource group. So this module provides operations for working with Azure resources. And here we have the reference documentation that, that I can also open. So do we have some examples here? The new client we can use. And we also need the subscription ID. So this subscription ID is also a concept in Azure where we now have a token of an account, but an account can have multiple subscription IDs. So this subscription ID, you will have to retrieve still. And we are just going to pass this as an environment variable, because once you have multiple subscriptions, then you will have to pick yourself in what subscription you want to launch your resources. So I'm going to pass this as an as an environment variable, but you can also pass this as a flag or hard code it. But be careful when you hard code it that you don't commit it to your public GitHub repository. So that's why you probably want it as an environment variable or as a flag. I'm just going to copy this, this to start with. I probably don't need the options right now. And here is more sample code of a resource group. And then I actually have a main.go. So create resource group is the one we need. Create or update resource group. And we need a context resource group name, the location we are going to pass. So the location is the physical location where you're going to launch. So they probably have here West US as a static variable declared. I'm also going to declare the location static. I'm going to do a get end of the Azure subscription ID as well. And that's how we're going to pass it. So we have a subscription ID. And then I'm going to initialize this client for our resource group. And I'm going to try and create a new resource group based on the same code here. So client is the new client and I need a subscription ID. So I'm going to say subscription ID. And then I can say string, or if my type is the same as the next parameter, I can also remove it. So this is going to be the subscription ID, the credential, and then the options. But if you don't need to pass any options, you can also pass nil. ARM resources, we didn't do a go get of this, so I will need to do a go get of this. So this was in the resources. I think it was this one. Not 100% sure. No, it's not that one. It's this one. That's it. So I'm going to save this one. Now it's imported the A ARM resources. And the new client is asking for a credential, an AZ core token credential. So this is what we probably want to return here in our get token. So let's have a look what happens. AZ core token credential. Oh, it's an interface of get token and our token here. Azure command line interface credential. It also had this get token. You see, there's one function, the get token function. So if we reply the token, 
and we have this interface get token, then we can nicely pass this credential. So we'll call this credential. So our subscription is a string and the credential is an Azure core token credential. And I just need to change it right here as well. Our token is a token credential. And we still need to pass the subscription ID as well. So, and the context. So let's try to initialize those. Context background and subscription ID is OS get env. Subscription ID. So either we pass subscription ID here with our go run, or you do add configuration. And in this add configuration, go launch package. You also can have env, and env is an object. And here you can then have the subscription ID if you want. Like this. So if you use the run within Visual Studio Code, you can define it here, your subscription ID. Otherwise, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to export it. Export, which doesn't really work on Windows. You might still be able to use another way to set an environment variable. Maybe something like set would work on Windows. Export subscription ID, and then the subscription ID that I want to use. And then I will do this command here, and then I will do a go run. So this subscription ID needs to be set because we are going to read this subscription ID. And also if you are on Windows and you don't really want to set it as an environment, you can also pass it as, as a flag. We have some other lectures where we used flags, the, the parameters that we pass. So this subscription ID, we can actually say if len subscription ID is zero, then no subscription ID was provided. And then we exit. And then we're going to pass the context, the token, and the subscription ID. Or actually subscription ID was first and then there was a token. Let's have a look. So subscription ID, first we have a context of context context. Then we have a subscription ID, which is a string, the credential and the public key. And that should be it. So we have the new client is of ARM resources. So the ARM resources client. Now we have the ARM resources client. If there's an error, then we're just gonna return an error. And then we can use this ARM resource client to create a resource group. Let's have a look in this example again. So here we had this example. Oh, we need to create a new resource groups client. Not sure if you did that. New resource groups client, and then we can use the create or update of this resource group groups client. Let's copy this resource groups client new resource groups client parameters are the same and then we can call this the resource groups client and then the resource groups response is the resource group when they call it group not groups resource group client create or update we pass the context then the name, then the parameters, then the options. And the options can be nil. So the resource group name, what should we name it? We can name it Go Demo. And actually I like it more if we just put it on one line because it's not that long. And then let's just say resource group params is these parameters. Because typically the parameters are going to be longer and then we can still put this on one line resource groups response okay and then the parameters okay and then the location what is the location going to be we can also use a static variable const location is west us do we now have everything 
oh, we have a comma too much here. This two is not declared. Okay, I just saved it and it was declared. This two is also a package in the AZ core. So this two is a helper function, just like we had with the ADOS SDK. We need to convert our string to a pointer. So two PTR actually takes a string, converts to a pointer, returns a pointer to the provided value. And then we have our location to our location variable, but this just passes a pointer. So you will see this two pointer is used a lot just to convert it to a pointer. And this is actually the reason why you need go 1.18 for this SDK, because this pointer and it's a function of T any, this pointer takes any type and will convert to a pointer. This implementation is done using generics. So it can take multiple types and then we will return you the type as a pointer. Now we have our resource group response. Do we need it? We probably need it, but a little bit later. Let me just put an underscore here, save this, and let's try to test it. So I'm first going to set my subscription ID. So how do you find your subscription ID? Easiest way is to log into your Azure portal and then look for subscriptions. Click on subscriptions and then here. I have only one subscription and my subscription ID is this one. It's a UUID, that's how it looks like. Export subscription ID. And then if you're actually on Windows, the Windows equivalent of export is set. You can also do set instead of export and with this UID, if you want to do go run, that should also work. You can also have bash installed on Windows if you want to use bash. That is also a very nice alternative. So we have exported our subscription ID, go run. And this should then create our resource group. Oh, invalid resource group location. Oh, and I already have this resource group in my West Europe. So what happened here is we have an error that there's a conflict. I already have this resource in West Europe and now I'm trying to recreate this in West US. So I would have to first delete this resource or I can just give it a different name. I will say go Azure demo. You can use go demo unless you also have used a name that is already in use. Go run and that worked. You can always verify whether those resources have been created by checking the Azure portal. So we have resource groups and then you can see our Go Azure demo. And if you click on it, we can see the resources within this resource group and there's nothing yet. So we are going to now create the next resources, the next resources that are necessary to launch our VM. Now that we have created our resource group, the next step would be to create our VNet. Let's have a look again in the documentation. This was the ARM resources. And if we have again a look at the resource manager, and then in network, ARM network, we should have the virtual networks. So there are a lot of files here. Let's have a look what they say here. More sample codes, a virtual network and a subnet. And to create a subnet, we also need a virtual network. So maybe I will just have a look at this example code right here because here we also create a virtual network and then we create a subnet. So let's have a look at create virtual network. We need the ARM network for that and the ARM network is resource manager network ARM network. I'll copy this already and then I'm just going to copy paste this code and this code is a little bit different than our resource group because our resource group and we have it still somewhere here, the resource group. 
the create resource group was just new resource group client and then create or update. And the resource group is immediately created because it's a logical structure. It's not a resource like a network or a VM that you have to launch. So you just kind of create it and then you immediately, immediately get the response. But with those VNets and with a lot, a lot of other resources, you actually do begin create or update. So it's not a create or update, it's a begin create or update. It just starts it and then you get a polar response. And then you can use pull until done to wait until this resource has been created because it can take a few seconds. It can take a few seconds, it can take a few minutes before this resource is created and only when it's created you have the response. So that's a bit different than our resource group and most resources are actually like this where you create the resource, you have to wait a little bit and then you get the response. So let's copy this code to create our virtual network client and then do a VNet creation. So I'll just copy this. So this was our create resource client and now we're going to do a create VNet. And this needs the ARM network. go get arm network and this also takes the subscription id the credential and the options which is null and then we have the begin creator update the context the resource group name resource group response is here and now we can use this resource group response colon here and we can use the name, the name of the resource group. It's basically the same as here, but then if you would like to change the name, you only have to change it in one place. This is the resource group name, and then we need the virtual network name, go demo, we'll call everything go demo from now on. And then we need the parameter parameter is of ARM network so I'm just going to save so that ARM network is imported and this is a string pointer but what does it need just a string so just going to put the star in front of it so that it's being passed as a string and not as a pointer and then we have the virtual network so the location we have and then we can pass the properties and one of the properties is the address space. So every Azure resource has properties and because this parameter is just a struct, it is actually very easy to see what is required as properties. So we have the virtual network. Virtual network has a location that you need and has a properties of the virtual network. And the properties is of virtual network properties format, which is then this type this struct type that we define here and then we have here all these options the main option that we have to pass here is the address space because a vnet needs an address space so address space needs an address prefix and the address prefix is a slice string slice as a pointer and then we have our string but because it expects pointers as elements, we do a two pointer and then we can say 10, 10, 0, 0 or 10, 1, 16. It actually doesn't matter. It's just your preference, what you would like to have as your address space. And then if there's no error here, then we are going to poll until done. So this is the polar response. So poll response poll until done, we pass our context, gives us the response. And this response is our VNet response. And this VNet response we can then use later if we need to know the name instead of using the hard-coded value. So what is next then? The create subnet. So the subnet works very similar. We have a subnet client. So we are going to inside the subnet client, begin create or update, and then poll. So I'm going to copy this. I'm 
put a comment here because here we are creating the subnet. The subnet, if there's an error, we're going to return error. The polar subnet client. Oh, polar response. So this is going to be a problem, I think. Can we reuse this polar response? Probably not. So let's call this vnet polar response. And then let's call this subnets polar response. Because these types are different, so we need to have different names for them. And this is going to be our subnets response. And we need a resource group name. So resource group response, resource group response.name. We need a virtual network name, vnet response.name. And we need a subnet name, go demo. And then we're going to create a subnet. And then we have a subnet response. And then we should have our subnet. We can already try to run this. No errors. Let's do a go run. And this is going to take some time. But this should run without issue. Now, at some point, we will get errors when we try to execute it again and again and again. And then it's best to actually start checking whether something already exists. Because ideally, you want to be able to run it over and over again, even though some resources exist. So let's see what happens if we're going to run it again now that our VNet and subnet already exist. So that went actually fine because there are no dependencies yet. But once we start creating dependencies, there's going to be an error that we first have to remove the dependencies and then we can only create this VNet. So let's continue a little bit and then I will keep on executing this. And at some point we will see that we will get an error and we'll have to add some extra logic to it. What is next after we created the VNet and the subnet? we can create the public IP. And let's have a look how we can do that. Now we should be able to write ourselves without using an example. I think the ARM network should also support a new IP address client. So let's try if we can have that. So it should be very similar as this. IP client new IP public IP address client. So you see there is actually a lot of resources here. Interface IP, load balancer front end, virtual hub. If you check the Azure documentation, you can see what the difference is between all these services. You can also sometimes start from the UI, create a few resources and see then what resources in the end you would need and then write this in Golang using the Azure SDK. Public IP address client. So this is going to be our public IP address client. And then you see the parameters are always the same. So you, you get a client, same parameters, then use this public IP address client to begin or create something. And this then also has very similar parameters. It's just the parameter of this resource that is then often difficult to know what to fill out. But then it should be the same what you fill out when you would create the resources using the portal. So if you don't really know what to fill out, I would create the resources first in the portal, see what the parameters are, then use those parameters in the SDK. So the context, resource group name, public IP address name, and then the parameters. Context, resource group name is the resource group response still, and then the name. And then we have the public address name, go demo, and the parameters of ARM network public IP address, and then the options, which can be nil. Then a comma, and then we just need to fill out the parameters here. 
and then we will have the polar response the polar response polar public IP polar response then the error and then we can do the poll until done and we also need to check on the errors so we can just copy paste this so that's poll response public IP poll response poll until done and begin creator update and then we just need to do the parameters what should be the parameter the location which we can copy paste from another one location and then the properties and the properties is of type arm network public IP address properties format you also see that the Visual Studio Code auto completed to make it easier and then what IP address do we want to associate we don't really want to hard code IP address we probably only want to define the allocation method because we want a static IP address public allocation method what does it accepts the IP allocation method and a comma oh and this is a string this is not a struct it's a string and it's a pointer so a two pointer and the string is going to be the allocation method but normally when it asks a string and it's some kind of method that it, there's only one or two options there's gonna be there's going to be variables declared within this package so that you cannot mistype it so if i type arm network and then i type in allocation no allocation there's nothing ip ip allocation and then here we have IP allocation method dynamic and we need static and this is of type IP allocation method so sometimes it's a little bit difficult to look for it you can also have a look at the reference documentation and then just look for this type IP allocation method to see what is available but you can see if you look a little bit and you type in part of the name you often can't find it like this so we are going to create this IP address we want a static IP address we don't want a hardcode IP address so we're just going to pass this so this is going to give the polar response and then we wait until we are done what's next I'm just going to add some comments so that I don't lose track this was a public IP what is next let's create a network security group that's also going to be in this arm network so let's copy this a little bit because we can start working from this new network security if i type network there's nothing but if i type security groups there's a new security group client create a new instance of new security group client this is going to be the one that we can use new security group client groups client new security groups client uh, creates and or updates a network security group so that's the one that we need so again it's not easy to always find the correct resource scrolling through the reference documentation and just having a look what is available and in the github repository having a look what is available is often the way to go this then has a network security group response that we can then use it's going to be the polar response that we can then use right here network security polar response poll until done and what does it need the context the resource group name the network security group name go demo and then the security group as a parameter the location is going to be the same and then we have the properties it's going to be of security group properties format and then we are going to have a different contents here a collection of security group rules so now what we want to do is we want to allow access to port 22 
You can allow access to port 22 just to your IP address, but to keep it easy, we are just going to allow all access to port 22. And then you can still change it if you only want to allow your IP address. I'm only going to run this instance for a couple of minutes, so it's easy to then just allow all traffic. So you see, we have a lot of read-only stuff. So security rules will be the one to go with. So security group rules, ease of new security group rule. And then we have our elements. And this needs to be of type arm network. Let's have a look what we need to put in here. A name of the security group and then again properties. And then we have the rule itself. So we have a name and this is going to be a pointer, I guess. Pointer is the pointer. Yeah, it's a pointer. So the name is going to be allow SSH. And then we have the, what was it? Properties. Properties is of ARM network security rule format. Properties format. And let's see. Yeah, and then it added this ampersand here because it needs to be a pointer. And then what do you have? Again, a description, destination address prefix, destination address prefixes. So one is just a string or a pointer string, and then one is also a slice. Destination port range, ranges, a priority, priority is just a code. So this actually just reflects exactly what you see in the UI. If you have created a network security group, this is how it looks like. So the content is going to be exactly the same. So you always have a source and destination. So let's start with the source, source address prefix. We only need one, so I'm gonna say prefix to pointer. What is our, our prefix gonna be? Just all IP addresses. Source address, source port range. Source port range can really be anything. So I'm going to say star because we don't really know what the source is. The destination though is going to be 22. So we have destination address prefix and this is going to be the same. We don't really know what it is. It doesn't really matter. But the destination port range is going to be 22. So we are going to allow access to port 22. We're going to have a protocol. What's the protocol going to be? TCP. So we have Azure Firewall Network Rule Protocol TCP. Is this the correct? We are looking for what? Protocol, security rule protocol. That's not it, I think. What do we have? ARM network. Something with TCP. Ah, okay, now I get a lot more. Something with TCP network. Inbound security rules protocol TCP. I think that's it. No, because it's of inbound. And I just need security rule. Security rule. Ah, there it is. If I type security rule TCP, it actually matches security rule protocol TCP and this is of security rule and this is of security rule protocol and this is what I'm looking for. What do you also have? You have the protocol. What is the access? We are going to allow, allow, access allow, security rule access allow. That also matches. And then what else do we have? Direction and description. Direction and description. Maybe first description. And you often only write these things once in your life and then you just copy paste it. That's how I do it. Allow SSH on port 22. Direction also to a pointer and the direction is going to be inbound security rule direction arm network inbound hmm. security rule inbound direction inbound 
security rule direction inbound yeah that's it so this rule is for inbound and then we still need the priority and the priority is what int 32 and this value can be between 100 and 1496 so it only depends if you have multiple rules i'm just gonna say thousand or thousand and one two pointer cannot use value of int needs to be an int 32 so if i say int 32 of this then it will make it in 32 pointer and then it works okay so this is the security group and then we're just going to poll until done. Let me rerun it because I actually didn't rerun it for the IP address. So let's see if it is still working. This worked. So now we have an IP address allocated and a network security group. But if I run this again, will this still work? Because what happens is we are going to recreate some of these elements. Okay, that still works. So we still are going to do a create or update of all these elements. So I just want to see at some point we'll get an error, but we are not there yet. So we can still run a go run as much as we want, because when you are developing, that's quite important. I find that you don't always have to go in and remove all the resources that you can just run a go run over and over again so that you can just keep on testing if there's one resource that doesn't want to be created because you have some mistakes in your properties or you are just testing out with the properties. What is next before we can launch our VM, our virtual machine, is we need a network interface. And this network interface is really going to tie everything together like our subnet and our network security group and our IP address. First step is to create a new client for this network interface. It's still in ARM network, new, what do we have here? You can create quite a few resources in this ARM network, new interfaces client we have. Subscription ID, credential, and no options. And then we're going to call this interface client. Interface client. interface client and what can our interface client create? A new interface, interface client, begin create or update, context, resource group name, network interface, go demo, parameters, arm network interface, and then the options. And then we have again this polar that I'm just going to copy paste. Public IP response polar, I'm going to copy paste here. So we have the network interface polar response and an error. And that gives us no errors anymore, so that should work. But now we need all these parameters. Location, that's an easy one, properties, now it comes, interface properties format, what do we need? Network security group, And typically when you refer to it, you can refer to it with ID. So we can say ID, and where is our network security group? Here, network security group response, and the network security response ID we can put here. Does this work? Undeclared name, because we need a colon here. Now it works. Network security group, we also need the subnet. Do we have a subnet here? I don't see one immediately, but it's most likely going to be in these IP configurations. 
because we have an IP configuration for a network interface. If you don't know immediately, you can have a look at the example code that might give you some clues. And let's have a look what's in here. So we have a slice. So this is slice declaration and then we have the elements. What do we have as elements? A name and properties. The name can be go demo and then the properties. Name needs to be a string, a pointer string. Properties needs to be interface configuration properties formats of ARM network. What's in there? A lot. We need a private IP address, but here we're also not going to declare a fixed private IP address. We want to have a dynamic private IP address. We wanted to have a public static IP address, but a private IP address can actually be dynamic. So what do we need to do here? IP allocation method. So arm network IP address allocation. And this time it's going to be dynamic. So very similar as we did with static, but now it's dynamic for the private IP address. The subnet. Let's have a look. Subnet. Subnet. Was it subnet or subnets? Subnet. Arm network subnet. And what's gonna go in here? Again, an ID. Where is our subnet? Where did we create our subnet? Right here we have a subnet. Subnet response. And then here we have the ID. So every resource that you create in Azure has an ID as well and that we need to pass basically subnet response. But I also need this colon, which I keep on forgetting every time that you create a new variable, you need this colon because the error was already defined. That's why you need now a colon. So we have all this. What is then the last that we are missing? The public IP address. And the public IP address was right here. Public IP address response a colon here and now we link everything together in this network interface arm network public IP address and the ID will be public IP address response ID looks good to me let's try to execute that do we have the poll until done yes we have and next will be the virtual machine because then we link our network interface with our VM. So now I have this network interface. What happens if I execute this second time? And now we actually get this 400 bad request that I was talking about. What does it want to do? There was an error when it did a put request for the virtual networks. So when you have these virtual networks, when you have this begin creator update, it can actually not update it because now you have a network interface. So any updates are forbidden. So ideally when we do this creation of this virtual network, what we want to check upon is does it already exist? And if it doesn't exist, we want to create it. But if it already exists, we want to skip it. Otherwise we will always get this error and we have to remove our network interface every time we want to execute this again. So it's actually best to have also some code to check on that. So that's what I will do next. I will create some code to check whether our virtual network already exists. And if not, then we will create it. Otherwise we will not create it. In this lecture, I want to check whether our virtual network already exists. And if not, we're going to create it. If it exists, we're going to skip it. So I'm going to write another function, find VNet. If we find our VNet, then we're going to skip it. So I'm going to say, if not found, then we're going to create it. So this code all belongs in, in here. 
but then I can already see that we need our VNet response later on because here we need the VNet response name. So VNet response is of type virtual networks client create or update response. So let's have a look how we can extract something out of it. We could just get a name, but then we, we don't have all the other attributes. So here we have virtual network and that's probably a better choice. Virtual network. So if we have a variable VNet of this type arm network virtual network then we can say vnet equals and then our vnet will be accessible right here because the scope is different the scope of this vnet response is only within this if and here outside this if we have declared the vnet so if you then say vnet equals to vnet response dot virtual network our vnet will be accessible by other functions outside this if statement find vnet we still need to figure out what are we going to pass to this find vnet. Well, maybe our virtual network client, because this virtual network client will need to check whether our vnet already exists. Find vnet, and then we probably also have an error here. So we are going to return found and an error. Let's write this function. Func find vnet and then vnet client and we return a boolean and an error. And this vnet client is of type arm network virtual network client. Return false nil. So we couldn't find it by default. How do we find it? vnet client, we can have this begin create function, begin delete, or we have a get. The get accepts the context, resource group name, virtual network name, and the options. So if it exists, then it will return this virtual networks client get response. If it doesn't exist, it will return an error, but if the operation fails, it returns an az core response error type. And this AZ response error type we can use to see what the error response is. So we need the resource group name, which is going to be a string, and we need the VNet name, which is also going to be a string, and we also need context. context. And we don't need to have this string here because we already defined here the string. These will be automatically both of type string. So context, resource group name, vnet name, and no options. Gives us the vnet and the errors. If there is an error, then we want to check whether this is an error because it doesn't exist or whether there is something else. We're going to have the vnet as well. So if it exists, we also want to probably return it. But we want to make sure that type is also the same. So here we have a virtual networks client get response. That's not something that we want to return. We would like to return VNet virtual network as well. And this is of type arm network virtual network, which is actually the same, which is actually the same as our VNet right here. So we can actually remove this do vnet is find vnet so this will be a vnet this will be of type arm network virtual network if it is not found then we are going to create one put this virtual network in this vnet and if we actually found one then we're not going to execute this and then the vnet that we found should be in this vnet variable context and then what else resource group response.name and the vnet name. The vnet name is going to be go demo. What is this? This needs to be a pointer. Okay. So find the vnet 
if it has not been found, we're going to create one, assign it to the VNet variable. If we find one, we can just use the VNet variable later on in our program, like here, for example. We need to return the VNet. If we don't have an error, we found it. So it's going to be true. If we have an error, then we need to check whether the error was not found or something else. And the way you can check on this is there are some helper functions that we can use to see if the error is of this response error. So if the error is not nil, then if error is s, s finds the first error in the error chain that matches the target. And if one is found, sets the target to that error value and returns true. So we pass the error as the first argument and then the target and the target can be any. And actually the way that this works is like the same way that we do a JSON Marshall or unmarshal. We are gonna create a variable first. So we're gonna have our error response of this AZ core response error. And then what it will do is, if one is found, set the target to that error value and returns true. So if this is true, then our error response will have the error in it and it will be of type az core response error so here error is of type error and if this is true if this errors as is true because this is a boolean then this target will contain the error value of this type az response error if you're confused by this have a look at the error handling lectures that we had in the beginning of the course where we had something similar going on this is the azure implementation of custom errors so now that we have this error response and if the error code is equal to not found, then we can return to our previous function that it's not found. And I think even that there's some other response codes that we could use status code is int. That's most likely the HTTP status code. So you could also just check on 404. So 404 or not found. Is going to be the same and then we return the virtual network which is going to be empty but we also say we didn't find it so we will have to run the code to create a vnet but if the error is not the not found error then we want to return the vnet virtual network which is also going to be empty we're going to say false but we're going to return an error because there's some other error that happened. So we still want to return an error in case something went wrong here with the get that we stopped the program. So that should be it really. Our VNet will only contain something if we are here, if we are returning true. In the other cases, it's not going to contain anything. And we need to check on this found variable. So let's have a look. So we already created our VNet. So let's do a go run and now it will not create a VNet because it is already found. Will that work? Let's see. And also when you test these flows in your program, you have to test it both ways because now you see it actually works, but we didn't create it the VNet, right? Because we skipped it. So let's try to run it again after we remove the VNet just to see if our whole program would still work. So not creating the VNet actually worked, but let's just delete everything again. Delete and then yes. And let's see then if we can recreate everything nicely. So it's now doing this delete. It's running. It will take some time, but then once these once these resources are removed, then I'm going to try to execute it again and see if it still works. And then we'll go to the flow where we still need to create a VNet. So succeed it. Go run. And now go run is going to create all these new resources. Oh, we got an error. Uh, we got a get error. Maybe I made a mistake here. Response 404 not found. Oh yeah, see, I made a mistake. So we ended up right here 
And because it's the error code, it's actually resource not found. And it's response 404 not found. So either we can check on the status code or I think we can do resource not found. Let's try that and see if that works. So that's what I mean with it's always important to check whether both flows still work because in our first flow there was no error because we just found it. So we returned the virtual network, but now we are basically just testing whether this code actually works. And now it works. And if you refresh here, and then if we have a look again in our resource group, we again have those four resources. So then the next step is going to be to create our virtual machine, finally. In this lecture, I'm going to now create the virtual machine. So let's have a look at the examples because where would we start? It's a bit difficult to know if you don't even know the package that we have to use. So this was our resource manager network example that we used earlier. Here we are in the Azure samples. Let's first go back into the Azure SDK for Go. I'm going to click on SDK, Resource Manager, and then we should have Compute somewhere. Resource Manager, Resources, Compute, ARM Compute. Here we have again lots of files. This is what you're going to need. Go get, Compute, ARM Compute, and then we have samples. We have a sample of a virtual machine that I'm going to use. So here we can go to the main.go and then we have the create VM function. So let's have a look. Create virtual machine is a function that they have. And then you can see we have a lot of parameters here actually and that's why I wanted to copy paste it because these parameters it's going to be difficult to find without an example so let me just import the package first and then let's copy paste these parameters go get arm compute all right and then we have this arm compute new virtual machine client this polar, polar response, exactly the same what we have been doing so far. I'm gonna copy this. And I'm gonna paste this right here. Create VM. And this can take a long time, so I'm gonna say creating VM just so that we know that we started creating the VM in the code because this is gonna take easily a few minutes. And if I'm going to save now, we're gonna import this ARM compute. We need the ARM compute new virtual machine client. So this is going to be the VM client. The SSH key we already have in this code. So we have the public key that we are passing. The location, the identity, and then we have the storage profile, the image reference, and here we need an image. What are we going to launch? A Windows server or a Linux server? I'm going to launch a Linux server and we need SSH key for Linux. This is the 1804, but I don't really like the 1804. So I'm going to use another one. And again, you can then, I think it was, it said here, AZVM image list output table to find the images. So I already know which one I'm going to launch. So I'm going to just change these variables a little bit to launch a 20.04. I actually found those in a GitHub issue on the Azure SDK where they were saying that you can use actually those for 20.04. You can still use 18.04 if you want, or you can even launch a Windows server. It doesn't really matter at this point. You just want to have the latest LTS of Ubuntu in general. So the latest LTS is 20.04. If there's a new one that comes out, then you can use the latest LTS. What do we have then? So we have the image and we need a disk. Disk name can be go demo. 
and the rest I'm going to leave. So this is just caching, the managed disk. These are all Azure options, like the way you want to have your VM. But I'm just gonna create a smaller 50 gigs disk for our virtual machine. What else do we have? Hardware profile. So yeah, what kind of instance do you wanna launch? This determines how many CPUs and memory you will get in your instance. I'm going to launch instead of F2, a B1, which is very small and it's a development instance. So it's very inexpensive to launch this one. Computer name, go demo. Admin username is gonna be demo. Admin password, I don't need. I'm gonna use an SSH key. So then we are going to say Linux configuration, disable password authentication, true. We don't need password authentication. We're going to use a public key and we are going to write this public key to the demo user. So this is where we're going to write it to in this VM. And this is our key. And our key, we pass it in all the way in the beginning. Our key is this public key. And it is actually asking for a pointer string. So what I could do is I could change this also in a pointer. Oh, not here right here. So now it's a pointer. And if I go all the way back to the bottom, so that then I don't need this two pointer anymore, I can just say pop key, because it's already pointer. So we have our SSH configuration, our network profile, that's where we need our network interface. Network interface output, no response, we call it. Copy this, and this is going to be the ID. And always this colon that I keep on forgetting, the ID. So we have network interface, which is going to give us the interface we created. We want to configure the login and password. We are not using a password, we're using an SSH key. Standard B1, and an Ubuntu image, and we have a disk of 50 gigabytes. So this is enough to launch our virtual machine. Begin creator update, resource group output, response.name, the name of the VM, I'll call it go demo, the parameters that we are passing, and then if it goes wrong, we return an error, and then we have the VM response, and I'm just going to output it when it is created. So I'm going to say printf vm created. And then I'm going to output the ID or the name. The ID is also possible. The ID will just be the full ID. That should work. We still have one error somewhere. Oh, the subscription ID. I have a capital D here. And is it going to work? I think so. So let's try to run it. And then I'm going to open a second screen and then I'm going to SSH into this machine. So let's have a look what this IP address was. So we could have either output the IP address because this network interface would also have this public IP address or while this VM is now creating, we could have a look in the portal. So in the portal, we have this network interface and this network interface has a public IP. Copy. I'm gonna open a new bash prompt. And we can use the SSH command. If you don't have the SSH command, then you can download OpenSSH for Windows, or you can use PuTTY if you are more familiar with PuTTY. But if you're using PuTTY, you will still need to convert with PuTTYgen this mykey.pem. We also have an SSH client that we built in one of these lectures. So you could also SSH into this with an SSH client. So I have a look at SSH demo, which also includes an SSH client. Demo is our login and then the IP address. And that should be it. So if you don't get this prompt, then 
you have to wait a little bit longer because it can take a few minutes before it is up and running. So now it's still booting and here we have our Go demo up for one minute. So this actually works. We have launched a VM and logged into the VM that we just created. And this is the output. This is the full ID of this VM that has been created. So we can just exit. And then if you don't want to keep the VM, make sure to delete it. So we can go back to the portal and then delete it. And then if you want to run it again, you can just go build this program again and run it or do a go run. So we have created quite a few resources. If you would continue to write on this program, I would definitely recommend to split this create VM out in multiple functions, maybe one function for every client. That's going to keep the overview a little bit better than what I did. I was just focusing on explaining how to launch these resources. So I didn't want to split everything in functions. So let's try to remove this VM and then we are finished with this demo. So if I go back to the resource group, go Azure demo, I'll refresh this and now I have this virtual machine. And you can remove this virtual machine and you should probably also remove the network interface and the public IP address and the disk just to make sure that you are not incurring any charges because the disk is going to cost you money, the virtual machine, but also the public IP address. If it's not in use, there's a very small fee to pay every month. If it is in use, you don't have to pay, but if it's not in use, you will have to pay for it. So make sure that those are for sure deleted. The network security group, you don't incur any charges for that and the virtual network neither. But to make everything clean, you could actually remove this whole resource group. If you are done testing, I will just remove this whole resource group. So that's it for this lecture. That was quite a lot to get this VM launched, but at least you got some training in launching all these different resources. So now if you want to launch another resource like a database, just have a look at the reference documentation at the SDK and it should be fairly straightforward, very similar to what we did to launch other resources on Azure. In the next coming lectures, I'm going to show you how to use Go with Kubernetes. If you're not familiar with Kubernetes yet, I would recommend you to first take a Kubernetes course. I have another Kubernetes course on Udemy, for example, that you can take. What are we going to do in this first lecture is I'm going to show you how to use the Kubernetes client in Go. Kubernetes has an API. It's a well-documented API that you can call using REST calls. So just over HTTP using X509 certificates for authentication. So we have certificates configured in our cube config configuration file. And using those certificates, you can authenticate to this HTTP REST API, the Kubernetes API, and interact with it. You could do this with curl, you could do this with the HTTP client in Go, but it would be again very evolved to do this all yourself. So there is a Kubernetes Go client available that will do all the heavy lifting for us. And we just have to supply the config file and the API calls that we want to make. The Kubernetes API will then reply with a JSON response when we do API calls. We do an API call and the Kubernetes API responds with JSON. This Kubernetes API is the same for any Kubernetes distribution, whether you run Minikube or on AWS using COPS or the Google Kubernetes engine or the Azure Kubernetes engine or anything else, it should always be the same. There are differences, but mainly in the API version of the Kubernetes API. So depending on what Kubernetes version you are running, you will need a different Go client. The version does need to exactly match, but on their GitHub page, they have a matrix to see what client version is compatible with what server version. To make these demos work, you need a Kubernetes cluster. The easiest way to have a Kubernetes cluster running on your machine is using Minikube. So let's have a look at Minikube. This is the Kubernetes Minikube GitHub page. So it's github.com Kubernetes Minikube. And here you can download Minikube either from the release or 
you could actually go to the documentation. There is the documentation here that has an installation page, the get started page. And here it explains what you need. All you need is Docker or similarly compatible or a virtual machine environment. What does that mean? You need either Docker installed, like just Docker for Windows, Docker for Mac, or you need virtualization support. HyperKit, Hyper-V, Parallels. VirtualBox is a free that you can download if you don't have Docker installed or it is not compatible with your system. Then your operating system, I'm on macOS, but if you're on Windows, then it's just a few commands that you have to enter to download the installer and to add it to your path. If you're on Windows, I also like this one, Chocolatey, it's a package manager. You can just install the package manager and then do Choco install Minikube and then it will do everything for you. I'm on macOS, I will execute these commands or you can use brew as well. And then you can start your cluster with Minikube start. If you have any problem with Minikube start, it will most likely be that you have an issue with any of these virtualization machine managers. So for example, if you run VirtualBox, there's a VirtualBox page that can have a look how to use VirtualBox. In the case of VirtualBox, you first need to download it and then Minikube start driver VirtualBox to run Minikube on VirtualBox. The easiest way I find is to use Docker. I have Docker installed, so Minikube will run within a Docker container on my laptop. So when I'm going to do the demo in the next course, I will have my Minikube cluster running. And the only thing that I did is just Minikube start. In this demo, I will try to deploy a new container packaged in a deployment on our Kubernetes cluster that is running locally. So I started in a new directory, Kubernetes demo. I did the go mod init. I have a main function. And the first thing I need to do is I need to read about how the Go client for Kubernetes works. So let's go to GitHub. If I type Kubernetes Go client in Google, then github.com Kubernetes client Go, this is it. And here it says what I need to do. First, it says have a look at the compatibility matrix. Depending on what version you are using, what Kubernetes version you are using, you want a different Kubernetes Go client and how to get it, go get client.go together with the version number. So also they say we recommend using the v0xy tags for Kubernetes releases 1.17.0. So I am on 1.24, so I should use v0.24 and then the minor version. So I'm on 20, so I'm going to use the 0.24.1. So go get Kubernetes client, go. This is what I copied from the main page, 20.4. So I am on 24.1. So you can know that by doing kubectl version or just have a look at your output of minikube start, it will also tell you what Kubernetes version you are on. Other versions will also work. So if you have a newer version, it most likely will also work. It just for best compatibility, you should use one that matches. It's just that there are new API calls introduced in later versions. So if you want to use those new API calls, then you need to use the correct version. For the API calls that we are going to use, you could even use an older version. So you could even potentially use this version. It just depends whether these API calls of this deployment are going to change if they change, you will need a new version for a newer Kubernetes cluster. And when we do this go get, we get an error. So it says it requires this Google cloud, google.com, this package and this package. And when it arrives at github.com golang mock 143, then it says cannot authenticate record data in server response. It's possible that when you do go get, and your version that you don't get an error. It just, there is something wrong currently in this mock repository. For some reason, I cannot get a 143 version, but then when I tried earlier, I can get a 144 version. So this is an excellent opportunity to show you how to force a certain version. So we can say replace 
and then this package without a version. So when we see github.com golang mock, replace it in still the same still the same package. We could also change another package. For example, if you would fork it on your own repository, make a fix, you could also do a replace and then this would be instead of golang, it would be your GitHub account. But we are going to keep it. We're going to keep it on this Golang mock. We're just going to force it to a different version. So we're going to say, I want to use the 144 instead of 143. And it actually works. So now we are using the v 241 Kubernetes client. And we're forcing it to use the mock version from 144. So just like our other packages, we first need to initialize it. We need to make sure that we provide the correct config. So let's have another look at this client go. They have an example somewhere how to use it. If your application runs in a pod in the cluster, please refer to our in cluster example. Otherwise, please refer to the out of cluster example. So there are two ways of authenticating in Kubernetes. If you're within the cluster, it's easier because then the API server is already there. You just have to contact it locally and it knows that you are coming from within a pod. But if you're externally, then you need to do authentication. You need your certificates. So it needs a cube config file. So let's have a look at this example, main go. And then here we have some code that we can use, create the client set. So this client that we need, and with this client set, we can then do API calls. So we can do core v1 pods, list the pods of my Kubernetes cluster or create a deployment. So I'm going to copy this client set because this is how we're going to get our Kubernetes config. Actually, I'm also going to copy this. Let me just copy everything. I will remove this flag parse because we are not going to work with flags. It's always good to start from an example. So we are going to call this R get client function and we are going to return we are going to return whatever this new for config is going to return we don't know yet because we need to save it and import some variables so let me just put this first all in the function so this is just the code that we copy pasted and i'm not going to work with this flag so i'm going to remove this first and what am I going to do? I am not going to check whether a home directory was supplied. I'm going to straight to this home directory. And that's going to be my path where I'm going to look for this kubeconfig file. So if you want to supply another kubeconfig, you can just hard code it here because build config from flags the second parameter here is just a path to your config file. The path to your config file should be your home directory. So this tilde sign is my home directory and cube config is then your Kubernetes configuration. On Windows, it should also be in a home directory, in the cube directory, and you should have the config file. If your config file is somewhere else, then you could override it. You could just say my cube config is, for example, just a file called config in the directory where I am executing this Golang program. So let's save this. It's not automatically adding all these, these things, these imports. So I will have to add them myself or I can copy paste them from the example. Let's just copy paste everything that I found here. Save this. It will remove the ones that I'm not using. And we might have to import some more. Let me try to see if I need to import this. Go get this Kubernetes. This is already imported. Go get this is also already imported. Yeah, because I did import of this and it also has all the subdirectories. Okay, so now that I did this go get, Visual Studio actually updated this go mod file. So now I have the correct packages in my go mod file. What do I get here? I get a Kubernetes client set. So what I'm going to return is this Kubernetes client set and potentially an error. 
And then I can say again, var client is my Kubernetes client set. And I'm going to do if a client an error, but then I will have to define the error as well. This is the error, get a client. If error is not equal to nil, then I'm going to print the error and I'm going to OS exit one. Save this. Okay, I need to remove this colon. Client is not used. And here I still need to return either an error or nil and the client set. Client set nil. Because nil, the error is nil. Client set is here. And I could already test this. So printf tests. I have no idea what is in this client. It just functions that we can use. So I'll just try to print it, which will give us some useless information, I guess. But I want to see if this actually works. So I'm going to clear, go run dot go. What does it do? No configuration has been provided. Try setting Kubernetes master environment variable. So it's actually not working as because my Kubernetes cluster is not running. So if I do kubectl get pods, it says localhost refused. So I need to still run my mini cube cluster. And it's going to say that it detected the Docker driver. And now it's going to create this Docker driver. So now it needs to run this Kubernetes cluster. So I'm sorry about the noise it's going to make, the background noise, because this is all very heavy. And then my MacBook starts using its fan as well. So actually, I'm not on 124. I'm on 123. But 124 will, will come out very early. I think I just have an older Minikube version right now installed. And 124 will be out very soon. And this 124, this 024 that I'm running here will work with the V23 as well. Let's try to run our program again. Okay, so now I have the client ready. So now we can do the actual deploy code and I'll just pause for a second because this fan noise will stop once everything is booted up. Now that we have the client, we can actually connect to our Kubernetes cluster. So let's try to run a deployment. I have here an apple.yml file of type deployment. This is the API version. It has a name, hello world deployment, and specification. We are going to run one replica, so one instance of our deployment. And then we have a selector which is going to select the template with the app hello world label. So we have here the template and the specification of our container. So this specification will run the Kubernetes demo from my Docker Hub repository and it will expose a port, port 3000. So this runs on port 3000. So this label we will also see in the pod definition. So later on we can filter on the pods that have this label to see whether our pod is running. What do we need to do first? We need to do the deployment. So let's create a function, deploy. And what are we going to return? We'll see that later. We'll start with an error. And then we can, we need to pass the client for sure. So we need to have the client, Kubernetes client set. And then here, let's start with an error, deploy, and we're gonna pass this client. So, and this we can remove, or well, we can say, just deploy it, deploy finished. Just so that we have something that we know that the deploy has finished. So how, how do we do this API call? Well, the API version is apps v1. So we will find this also in this client. 
you see apps v1 is an endpoint on this rust api so you will see within this client package we also have this division the same as the api endpoints so apps v1 deployments and here we have to pass something a namespace which is a string so either we can say empty which, which is going to then use the default namespace or we can specify the default namespace or we can create a namespace so i'm going to say default or you could pass it as a parameter or you could just hard code it where if you want to deploy to another one then default so default is the one that is there by default in minikube and we can then do apply create delete get list patch update let's start with create because that's the easiest one create and we need to pass a context so let me pass again a context here and then i will have a new context here context background and i will pass it as well context so we have a context and then we have a deployment v1 deployment so this v1 deployment is actually all this but it needs to be in this v1 deployment type and it's still in yaml so we need to parse this and actually this these kubernetes packages they have something to parse it so let's well actually not let's not do it like that let's pass deployment and then we're going to say par deployment is a new pointer to v1 deployment then we need to add another argument our create options create options which doesn't seem to work because what is v1 here apps v1 let's have a look in this create definition meta v1 okay so we can just copy paste meta v1 so these are the create options that we can pass meta v1 oh meta v1 and then here this also needs to be called meta v1 and it doesn't work meta v1 create options works but ah it's not a pointer so meta v1 this is how we should do it what does it return a deployment we call it deployment response the error and then if the error is not nil we can return the error deployment error like this once we have deployment response what we actually want is we want to return these labels we're going to assume that whenever we do a deploy we're going to have these labels and in the next function we want to filter on these labels when we get the pods just to see if the pods are running so if you do if you reply from this template the labels then we can later on use them so if i say deployment response and then we have what do we have here the specification and we have this here as well specification then we should have a template and then we have labels and then we have no error but we need to change our function signature because now we are returning a map this will be a map app it will be the key and hello world value and we just need to make sure that we also return something here so the map will be nil but we still have an empty deployment object we cannot deploy an empty deployment object because it will not work it will give us an error we still need to convert this yaml file into this deployment struct and now you could use some yaml unmarshal package to marshal this into this specification i actually tried it and that doesn't work 100 percent and when i was looking into the documentation i found that this go kubernetes client has its own functions to do the unmarshalling so it's some kind of helper functions that can help you it's not very well documented at this point in time so i just found it in a github issue and i'm just going to copy paste the code that i found in this github issue and then i will try to explain it so these are the two lines 
Scheme Codex Universal Deserializer, so they call it deserializing your YAML into the Kubernetes scheme. And this is the decode function that we are then going to call. And the only thing that we need to supply to this decode function is the contents of our Apple YAML. And it will magically make a Kubernetes object from it. So that's all good, but I already saved it and it couldn't find the scheme. So we'll need to help Visual Studio Code a little bit. And it's going to be in this Kubernetes package, in this client Kubernetes package for Oak of Go and its scheme. And now it found it. So app file is then bytes. So this is actually a function. So we could actually make this a bit shorter because we're only going to use it once. So we could also just say scheme codex universal serialize a decode. And this is our function, our decode function. Decode attempts to deserialize the provided data, which is YAML, but I think it can also be something else. It can probably be also JSON. That's why it's really a decoder and not just an unmarshaler, it, because it just accepts bytes and YAML and JSON are compatible. So it says the object is not guaranteed to be populated. We need to still, this runtime object, we still need to figure out whether it's a deployment object. Let's start with reading our file. So app file error equals IO read file. It's IO util read file and read file expects a file name. Our file name is apple.yml. Read file error in case it has an error. So we read the apple.yml file pass it here to the decode function and the decode function gives us a runtime object. This object is going to be of type v1 deployment, but we don't know yet because this is a universal function for all the Kubernetes objects. It just gives us a runtime object and we need to test whether this could be of type v1 deployment. And if it is of type v1 deployment, we want to put it in this deployment variable and then do this create. So how do we do that? We can use switch object type. And if the type is v1 deployment, then we can say case v1 deployment. Then we know it's this type. What if it is not this type? Then we can make catch all default. So then we can say return an error, unrecognized type, and the type is of group version kind. So it also returns the type, this universal serializer. So if we don't know, then we can give a clue, and then we might have to add more cases. So v1 deployment, if it's v1 deployment, then deployment equals the object, but with the v1 deployment type. So we're just going to change this object type to v1 deployment, save this. And then we could actually test it. So let's try to test it. Let's have a look whether we have deployments. kubectl get deployments. No, we don't have any deployments. We don't have any pods. Okay, let's run this deploy. Oops, I still have an error somewhere. Oh yeah, I didn't change this code here. So we will say deployment labels is a map string string. And then deployment labels, deploy finished. Did a deploy with labels. I never was that going to output it. Deploy labels. All right, let's try again. Let's check our deployment. kubectl get deployment, and we have the hello world deployment. And we have the pod running. Let's try to do another go run. And this is a bit annoying. You can only run it once because it already exists. 
So let's try to change our code a little bit so that we, we can make changes to our app YAML and then it will still apply the changes. What I want to do now is I want to check whether the deployment already exists. If not, I want to create it. If it exists, I want to update it. So instead of create, we can also do a get. I want to do a get context, then the name of the deployment and then the get options. So context, the name deployment name, which should then be hello world deployment and then the meta v1 get options. What is returned? A deployment. But I actually only want to know whether it exists or not. And if it doesn't exist, it will throw an error. So I will just check if there's an error. If error is not equals to nil, and now I want to split it out, I want to say if there is an error and it is not found, then I want to do something. If there's an other error, I want to return an error. And there is a package within the Kubernetes client that we can use for that. There's an errors package that can check whether something is not found. So I'm going to add the Kubernetes IO API machinery and the errors package. And you might have to do a go get of this package if you don't have it yet. What you can then do is if error is not nil and errors is not found of the error. So if this error includes is not found, is not found returns true if the specified error was created by the new not found. So if, if this deployment get returns is not found, then we go in this conditional, else if error is not nil and the errors is not found, but we are going to reverse this. So if it's not, is not found, then it's a real error. Let me say deployment get error. And otherwise, if it's not found, then we just move this code in here, because if it's not found, then we need to create it. If it is found, then we're going to update it. And then we need to have the update options. That way we can override our deployment just like that if it is already created. So there's a deployment. So let's test this. No deployment. Deploy finished the deploy with labels. Map hello world. One replica. Let's now put three replicas. And then instead of an error, we should get the deploy is finished, the deploy. And now we have three replicas and three pods running. So, and then if you put it back to one, then it should still work. So this now will do the update if it already exists and a create if it doesn't exist. Now next, what we can also do is we can have another function to wait for the pods, whether they are running or not. Here they are quickly running because we already have downloaded the image and there's no health checks on it, but other pods, it can take a couple of minutes before they are in the running state. So we want to check on that. Now that we have our deploy running, let's have a look at how we can wait after our deploy. So we do our deploy, but ideally we want to make sure that all the pods are running because the deploy only creates a deploy object, a deploy resource in Kubernetes. It doesn't mean that our pods are already running. So ideally, and that's why we are getting these deployment labels, these deployment labels are going to be pushed to our pods. So our pods will also have the labels app and hello world. 
So we can filter on those, as long as those are unique, to see whether our pods are running. So I'm going to make another function. Deploy client, and I'm also going to pass the deployment labels, which is a map string string. So it's going to be the key is going to be the app and the value the hello world. Wait for pods. I'm going to call it. And I'm just going to copy this. This is going to be called wait for pods. And we're going to return an error in case something goes wrong. And we're going to pass this, these labels, which is a map string string. And at the end, we're going to return nil. What are we going to do? We are going to block our Golang program with an indefinite loop. And to make an indefinite loop, you just write for, call three brackets, and then we will stay forever in this for loop until we hit the break point. Once we hit break, then the loop is over. In this loop, we are going to list the pods, and only when they are all running, we're going to break. And otherwise, we're just going to keep our program running. Or we could say also that we are only running it for 10 checks. So after 10 times we checked whether the pods are running, we abort or we could just keep it running and you can abort with Control C. So we are going to use client, client apps v1 again. Oh, it's not going to be apps v1 because it's not going to be a deployment or a daemon set or a replica set. It's going to be a pot, and a pot is in a different function. It's in, let's have a look what we have, core v1. So you see you have auto scaling, badge, certificates. There's a lot of API endpoints that you see here that are typical in Kubernetes. Core v1 contains the pods. Here, core v1 and then pods. Pods accept a, a namespace. Namespace can be default. You can make a static variable of this. Or you could even pass it as a parameter instead of repeating it. And what are we going to do? We are going to list the pods. Lists accept the context and meta v1 list options. And it returns a pod list and an error. Pod list error. If there's an error, then pot list error. And now we can iterate over the pots. So we are looking for pots not running. So pots not running is zero. Then we're going to do a for loop for key value range pot list pot list is not an array it's a struct pot list items is an array so we're gonna iterate over that and then we get a pot we don't need the key so we use underscore which means that we don't need this variable and it's a pot then we can say if pot what do we have here pot status and what is status? Pot status. Pot status phase is not equal to running. So it's not equal to running. Then we say pot's not running. Plus plus. So plus one. And then if our pot's not running is zero, then we can do the break. Pot's not running. Let's make this pot running actually. And then if it's equal to pot running, then we're gonna increment this because we need at least one running otherwise. Otherwise we're just going to exit. So if pot's running, and then I will have also all pots. Or I can use the length of the items. Pot's running, if pot's running is greater than zero, then we have pods running, but pods running also needs to be equal to the length of the 
pot list item so because all our pots need to be running and then we can break what is not happening still is that we are not passing our labels so let's also pass our labels and we can pass our labels in the list options we have a label selector a selector to restrict the list of returned objects by the labels defaults to everything so we can say label selector and it's going to be a string and we can again use some helper functions if you want so we already use this errors errors helper functions of the api machinery and we have some more helper functions in there we have the labels and we just need to remove this api because it's not an api it just pkg labels and if we then have look at labels and just comment this out labels and well, that doesn't seem to work labels i'm just gonna save no sometimes it's a bit difficult if you haven't imported a package yet to get the visual studio code to autocomplete so this is clearly labels but it doesn't want to autocomplete labels so if i command click on this then I get the API machinery a labels documentation and then I can also have a look here so there is a validate selector from set that I'm going to use validated selector from set returns a selector labels validate oh and now I see what is going wrong so if you use your labels as a map string string you cannot use labels from the import so i'm just need i just need to rename this one labels deployment labels and now i will be able to use labels from my import validate and then i can pass a labels set and this label set is a map string string so i can just pass this deployment labels in this validated selector from set and it will reply a selector i'll say parse labels or validated labels error so if my labels are invalid it will also return an error so it's a very nice helper function just to make sure that your labels are correct and this then has a function to pass to a label selector just a string function and then it will be 100% correct what we pass to our list options. So now we do the wait for pods. We have a for loop. But I'm just a little bit scared that we are going to breaking out of the for loop too quickly because not all pods might be created at the same time. So what we could do is we could also reply the replication amount if we say deployment response spec replicas then we could use also the amount of replicas that we expect in our wait for pods function just to be 100% sure for our simple use case i don't think we need it we could also just do a time sleep here which is not very nice but we could also just wait a little bit before we are going to check whether this deployment is created in general when we are using minikube the pods are pretty quickly created so for our use case it shouldn't really be a problem but if you want to be sure and you want to check off all the edge cases you will need to also make sure that the pods that are running is equals to the replication factor so if we are checking we can say waiting for pods to become ready running d out of d and we can say pods running that's the ones that we found and the total is the pot the length of the pot list items and like just n and then we go to do a time sleep five seconds 
and then we will just sleep five seconds and then go again in this indefinite loop until we break the loop. I think that's it. I would like to test this. Let's already spin up our mini cube cluster and we just go over the code one more time. So we have the pot running zero. We do pot running plus plus if the phase is running, only if the pot running is greater than zero and is equal to the total of the pods that are being returned, then we're gonna break. Sounds okay. Let's test this. Go run go. Uh huh. Waiting for pods to become ready. So you see, so that's why we need this zero, because when we check the first time, there's no pods, and if you wouldn't check for this greater than zero, it would already have kicked us out. Okay, deploy finished. Did it deploy with labels map hello world. So we could actually put this FMT higher so that it's also outputting one out of one. So you do a kubectl get pods. We have one. Let's try to do this with three. Not sure if this is still going to work because when we change it, it's already, it's already going to see, it's already going to have a pot running. So that's why we need this deployment response, spec replicas, so that we can pause it as well. Expected pots is an int. Was a replica an int? Int 32. I'm going to dereference it and then int. Oh, and then I'll just need to add, change all the returns. Add zero everywhere. I'll make it int 32. And then make it here also in 32. Still have an error. That's it. And then we can add expected pods and we can pause it here. And then we add a parameter. And we just need to compare and pods running equals to expected pods. Okay, and also because pods running is int, we, we need to change the type from int32 to int. We could have also done that earlier and we didn't have to pass int32. We could have done that here as well. Could have done that right here as well if you wanted. Okay, let's try this. So Let's now start five pots. Waiting for pots to become ready. Uh -huh. And now it works. We have, first we have three out of three and now we have five out of five. So this is how we can also have a function to wait for the pots. And then we can have another function after wait for pots where we do something with those pots. Maybe we want to update another system or we want to execute something in them or we want to verify something. It's always good to have a function to wait for a certain state. And this is where we wait for a certain state. And this is typically implemented with a for loop that is going to be running forever until we break the for loop. So that's it for this demo. We have created our first Golang program that can interact with our Kubernetes cluster. And the other API calls are very, very similar. So once you know how to work with pods, you can use this client set to interact with all the other APIs as well. In this demo, I'm going to rework the Kubernetes demo, the deploy that we did in the previous demo. And I want, instead of to supply this, this app.yml, I want to have this app.yml on my GitHub. And whenever I make a change in my GitHub repository, I want to have it updated on my Kubernetes cluster. 
So I'm going to create a new GitHub repository, add a webhook, and when this webhook is invoked, I want to have it deploy on the Kubernetes cluster. So what do I need to do for that? Let's have a look. I first don't need these, so I can remove those. And then the get client, I'm going to change a little bit because I want to eventually run this in my cluster. So I'm going to say in cluster bool and then if in cluster, then we are going to do something else than, uh, than not in cluster. So the config is going to be different if we are in the cluster because now we have rust in cluster config. And this returns also rust config, just like this one. So I'm going to move this in my if right here. I'm going to declare the variables air and config right here. And this also accepts an error. So now we have the get client that is going to create a client set depending whether we're going to pass in cluster or not. We are first going to say false because I want to test it first outside the cluster. Then when it works, I want to move it in the cluster. So we might not need everything here anymore. Let me clean this up a little bit. And what we are going to do is we're going to create a server, an HTTP server that is going to be able to receive our webhooks from GitHub. So GitHub, every time there's a push, is going to send us a webhook, so we need to be able to capture those webhooks. GitHub is just going to send us a post request. We just need to capture that post request. HTTP listen and listen and serve. This is how we can listen on a port in Go. The address can just be 8080, so that it listens on port 8080, and we don't need a handler. We don't need this handler. We're just going to define one HTTP handler here, we are going to say that if we hit webhook, then we are going to invoke an HTTP function. So we need to write our server and our server will have an HTTP function. So let's create a new file, server.go, still going to be package main, but you could perhaps move this to a separate package if you later want to make it a bigger program. Then we're going to have a function, our webhook. And I'm just going to copy this function signature from here. So handle func, accept a function. This is the function I'm going to write. And it's going to be our request and our writer. So that's HTTP. And then we're going to write a struct that's going to keep all the information that we need. Type, let's call it server and what information are we going to keep? This client. That's the first thing we are going to keep. And now we can define it. S is a new server and our client is the client. And then we can pass the function. But if we're going to pass this function webhook, this is going to work. It's going to compile, but this webhook doesn't have access to our client. So if you make this function part of our struct, then we will be able to reach a client using s.client. I'm going to save this, and then we just need to do s.webhook because now the webhook is within the struct. I'm going to save this, and fmt printf test just to see if it works. Will it work? Uh, no, it doesn't work because my Kubernetes cluster is not running. Let's maybe just comment this and this, and let's try again. Okay, 
seems to be working. Curl localhost 8080, page not found. Okay, and now bitweb hook it output test. So this is working. All good so far. You can uncomment this. Our server is working. What do we need to do when we hit this webhook? We need to do the deploy on the Kubernetes cluster. Where do we get this deployment file from? This app.yml from Git. So the webhook will supply us some information, some information in the JSON from the push notification, and we can analyze that. There's a GitHub SDK for Golang, so let's have a look at that. GitHub Golang SDK, I typed this in Google, and then we have the go GitHub. So we can do go get github.com, Google slash go GitHub v45. And then how, do we, how does it work? We can construct a new client. We can do authentication. So we can pass our access token in case our repository is private. Then we can supply this access token. And then we can use this client. And this client has several ways of then querying the GitHub API. And it's all described in the Godoc reference. So for example, we want to download a file from our GitHub repository from, from our GitHub repository. So if I just look for download here, download artifact. Download contents. Artifact is probably something else. Download contents is download a file. And we can pass an owner, a repo, file path. So we can try to download our file using this function from the repositories service in this GitHub SDK. So GitHub will send us a push. You just have to analyze this push. It's a JSON. In this push request, it will tell us what files are updated and added. And then for every file that is updated and added, we can invoke this download contents. And then we just need to do the deploy on Kubernetes to send the YAML definition that we basically put on our Git repository. So this webhook, let's have a look how this works. There's a webhook section here. Go GitHub provides structs for almost all GitHub webhook events. How do they look like? Yeah, we need a push request. So if I look in the list, there's a push. And there's an example payload. So we already see here commits, an array of commit objects describing the pushed commits. And here's an example. So this is how it looks like. We will extract from the repository the name, and we have the full name, and we have repository owner, the name. So we could use name plus repository name, for example. And then we just have to extract the files that are added, send it to our Kubernetes server. This is the event and we can parse this event using this GitHub SDK. So we don't need the structs ourselves. We don't need to create these structs to translate JSON into Golang. This is all done for us. So we could basically copy this code and make an event for a GitHub push and extract the parts that we need. So let's try that out. Let's first initialize the client. And we are going to support authentication. So let's copy this. So we could create another github.go. We could just do it here. We have the get client and we do get github client. What will it return? We don't know yet. It's going to return this new client from GitHub. So let's make sure that we do a go get. Go get of this GitHub. We added this. Let's add this here. Go GitHub. I call this GitHub. And 
GitHub new client. Let's save this. Oh, now that I look at it, there's a slash GitHub that we need to add. It's going to be like this. Package GitHub. And then new client it gives us a GitHub client. So we can do a return of the GitHub client. And we can pass the access token. And what if we don't have an access token? What if the GitHub repository is public? Then we pass nil. So we can actually say if access token is empty, then we are just going to return a client with no authentication. And otherwise, I'm gonna add the context here. And otherwise, then we are going to use a static token access token and the new client. So it uses this OAuth2 package to make sure that every time we do a get or post request that this includes this token. So there's almost nothing we have to do ourselves. We just have to glue all this code together. Get GitHub client returns a new GitHub client. We need to store that again. We can say GitHub client and then here we can say get hit up get github client pause the context context is a new context and the second parameter is our token i will just read the token from our environment github token does it all work or does it reply String, what does this reply? The GitHub client, is there no error? Okay, there cannot be any error, so we don't need this error. Then we have GitHub client. And then we're going to use GitHub client. Is GitHub client, we need to add it here as well. GitHub client is a GitHub client. And actually, Maybe we don't even need this intermediate variables. We could also remove this. Say s is a new server and then still do s.client and s github client. And this is the same. And then we need a little bit less of code, which is always beneficial. Okay, so far so good. GitHub github client. I'm gonna save this. This is going to be imported. Still an error here, I'm not sure why. Probably have to, okay, I needed another go get. And then maybe my go mod was not updated or something like that. So what do we need to do now? Let's have another look at this webhook code. Can just copy paste this to start with. What is our payload? Validate payload. And then we can just pass the request, HTTP request. So if you pass the request, then it will extract the payload itself. So this JSON, it knows how to extract it as long as we pass this request. And then we have the webhook with secret key. So we need to have a webhook secret key, which is going to be of type string. And we also need to get this from somewhere. So I'm also going to provide this webhook secret as an environment variable, os getenv webhook secret. And this is a secret that we can define when we create the webhook, just as a validation, whether it's our own webhook or it's someone else's webhook making these requests. So that if you don't have the secret, that you cannot impersonate that you are GitHub. If error is not equal to nil, then what should we do then? We should probably send an error 500 back to the client. We can do that by doing right header, header right, header right 500, which, is gives, which gives us a 500 error. But then we also would like to print the error on our screen or in our logs eventually. 
and then we say validate payload error and the error and then we return so we stop the function so we could put these three lines in a function and call this function or we are just going to be a little bit lazy and copy paste it first is a validate payload then we're going to parse the payload and then if it's parsed it's going to be an event and that event we can again check to see what type of event it is and these are types in go from this sdk and we should have a push event type and this is the event type that we are going to use we probably want the default as well to just say that we don't have this kind of event event not found event not found and then the event type what is this 500 oh i'm probably using the wrong function right what is this http request oh I, I see what i did this is the response writer and this is the request and this webhook secret key should be a byte byte and then this writer is going to be write header 500 so we're going to write the header which is of code 500 and that should all work we save it oh this also need to be request save it looks like it all works so the webhook comes in we validate it we parse the webhook and then what do we do with it so now that we have access to this push event we could extract some information and mainly we're going to have to extract the files so this is going to contain the commits so let me write a function for that so I'm going to pass this commits to a function files is get files commits and then I will write this separately because this is going to take some space get files commit and commit is of head commit commits is of github head commits get files what do we return a string slides we will need to loop over these commits this is one commit range commits so let's loop over this and then let's have a look in this commit what is in this commit we have removed we have added and we also have modified so let's say that we have all files is a string slice now we want to append to it but this edit is also a slice so we basically want to merge two slices, which we can also do with append we just need to add three dots after our slice and then these two slices will be merged and we will be put in all files we can do the same for the modified files but what if a file then is duplicated so let's try to remove all the duplicates as well how to do that easily we can put all the files in a map and then put the map back into a slice so we're going to have all unique files is a map string bool and then we're going to go iterate over these all files file 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 name range all files and then what we are just going to say all unique files is file name and it's true all unique files file name true and then we still need to convert it back into a slice so now we can say for file name range all unique files and then we can say all unique files slice is another slice i'm probably doing it in too many steps because i could have put it in 
I could have put it in a map already here. But yeah, now I've already started it. What are we going to do then? Append this file name here. And then we're going to return all unique file slices. When I write something like this, I always want to test it. So let's write a server test go and quickly write us a test. Test get files t testing t. And how do we test this? We get the files. Files equals get files and then we have to supply github head commit and save it first so that github is important and the head commit is an array so we need an extra set of curly brackets and then we added a file added string test.txt and then we have no modified files. If files, if len files is not equals to one, then we're gonna say lock fatal f, no, not lock t fatal f expected. This one needs to be modified. Expected only one file. And I have more than one file. Let's try to test this. Files declared but not used. Oh, it will be here. Files declared and not used. And then commit is not found because it needs to be event commits. And let's just print this out. Found files as, and then we're gonna join them together files and a comma okay that should work run test what does this do okay it passes and then back to the server now we have the files what do we need to do now now we need to download the contents for every file from github so another loop file name range files and then we have this git github client repositories and what was it something with download download contents and download contents gives us a read closer the response and error downloaded file i don't think we need a response and the error if the error is not nil then again, we'll do this. Download contents error. What goes in it? The context. Do we have a context? No, we don't have a context. We only need it once, so I will say context background. Context background. And then, oh, my MacBook seems to not be able to follow for a second. It's because I'm making it a bit messy here. Context owner repo file path and options. Contents. And what was it? Repo. Repo is I can find this in this event. Event repo. And then first I need the owner name is going to be the GitHub username and event repo name. And then the file path is file name and then GitHub repository contents get options, which is probably going to be empty. And then I think that these are pointer strings. So I want to make sure that we pass them we pass actual value to them. Save this. And now I have this downloaded file. It's of IO read closer. So I need to make sure that I also close it. Close, but with defer. 
and then we can download it just like we did with our HTTP streams. We can say IO read all downloaded file. And this is the body file body error. Again, error handling read all. Now that we have the file body, we can do the deploy. Deploy, we need a context. So let me just use the same context again. Context is context background and context background. And then pause the context here. The client, we could also move this deploy into this server struct and then we wouldn't have to supply the client, but it doesn't really matter here. And then we get back the map, the pods, and whether there was an error. I don't think we need those first two, but we need to pass this file body somehow. So I'm gonna pass this file body, which is of binds. And I'm going to add a parameter app file. And I don't need to read app file because this also reads everything in bytes. I'm going to save this. This works. This works. Save this. Deploy error. So, what else do we need? So, we are first going to test this outside our cluster. And it's going to then do what? Start a server. Start a server here. It will initialize my GitHub client and my get client. It will then wait for the webhook. If there's a webhook, it will validate it, parse it. We'll get some information out of it, like the owner of the repo, the name of the repo, the files. And then for every unique file we have, we'll do a deploy. And then we can just say deploy of file name finished. And then file name is the, the file name is the file name. All right. So let's try to get this operational. We need a webhook secret. I'm just going to enter the environment variables here. If you are on Windows, I think what is easiest is to add a configuration, uh, go launch package, and then you have the env here, env that you can use. So here you can then say webhook secret and so on. And then you do run, run without debugging, and then the environment variables are injected. I'm not going to do that. I'm just gonna put them on screen here. Webhook secret, my secret, I can choose it myself. So I'm just gonna keep it simple. And the GitHub token. So we still need to create a GitHub token. So let me create a GitHub token for my own GitHub account. So this is my account. And on the right top, I will go to settings. And then there's developer settings here at the left bottom. And then I'm going to create a new personal access token. You can click generate new token. You'll have to enter your password. We are doing a go demo. Only to be valid for seven days. And then we'll need to have repo control. That should allow us to access the repositories and then download the data. Generate token. This is a token. I'll copy it. And then I can enter it here, the GitHub token. And I'm going to do go run.go, which will not work unless I'm going to start my Minikube cluster. But how can GitHub access my server if it's running on my computer? Well, either you have a public IP address, which I don't have because this is just a residential connection. I mean, I have a public IP address, but this port 88 is not going to be accessible on this public IP address unless I'm going to do some complicated port forwarding. So the easiest way 
to have the forwarding setup is to use something called ngrok. It's another piece of software that you can download. So if you go to ngrok.com, serve web apps with one command. Sign up for free. So this you can download. Brew install ngrok or with Windows zip file or you can install first Chocolatey, the package manager, and then install ngrok or there's also um, Docker. So it's the fastest way to put anything on the internet. So you install this and then when you have it installed, you will have to run ngrok. So I already have it set up. So I'm just going to type ngrok and then it will give me the help. Ngrok. So ngrok will tunnel local ports to public URLs. So if I do ngrok HTTP 80, it will make 80 public, but I'm going to write on 8080, so I will do ngrok HTTP 8080. Ngrok. So I'm online. My session will expire in two hours. There's terms of service that you can read, and I should be able to access my server at this URL. So let me do another bash here. Curl of this URL. It's not working because I get like a whole page that is not working because my server is not running. Okay, we need to do go run just a dot because we also have server.test. Allow. And now I can go to my bash screen and I get a not found, which is also not only really showing here, but this window is too small, I think. You see, 404 not found. So this was the first one that was not running, and now I get a 404 not found. So this is working. So now I just need to use this URL, slash webhook, and set up the webhooks in GitHub. So I'm going to go to my repository that I created. I created a separate repository for this. The Go Deploy Kubernetes GitHub. And this one is private, so that we can immediately also test this token. First, I'm going to create a webhook, and then I'm going to create a file. So webhooks, add webhook slash webhook. So this URL comes from ngrok, the secret, which I supply as an environment variable, my secret. Enable SSL verification should work because ngrok is doing the SSL for us. Which events would you like to trigger? This webhook, just a push event. So if there's a push, then it should trigger this webhook. Add webhook. Now the webhook is active. Should have this check mark next to it. And I can add a file. Add file, create new file. And I'm going to use this app.yaml that I used in the previous lecture. So this one is the Kubernetes deploy, app.yaml. Just gonna copy paste this one. This is the one I want to deploy. I'll first give it a name. And let me just check that my Kubernetes cluster is empty, that there's no deployment running. kubectl get deploy. There is no deployment running. I'm not cheating. Going to test this webhook and I'm not sure even if it's gonna work. I hope it will work. <laughs> oh, there is already something that happened here. Event not found. Oh yeah, so when you create a webhook, it creates an event. So maybe it would be good to also capture this I didn't really think about that one. Case GitHub hook. Oh yeah, there's a hook. And this is when the hook is created. So then we can just say hook is created. And then it will not say event not found. Hook is created. And we, you would have to restart your server actually for this to work and then you would have to recreate the webhook if you want to have this nice output but just pushing the file now should trigger the webhook as well 
go deploy Kubernetes GitHub. So this is where I configured the webhook. This is a special repo that is empty. Best to keep it separate because otherwise you will just randomly push files to your Kubernetes cluster. You could add a filter on YAML and all these things if you want some more complexity. And yeah, this should be it. Commit. Let's try. And let's have a look. Found files, about YAML. Need an extra return here. Deploy of Ampot YAML finished. Wow, and we have now the 200 OK here. Let's have a look. Oops, I'm opening too many windows. Oh, and the deploy is there. No, it's not. No, it's pots. And the pot is also there. That's good news. Let's try to update our. Let's try to update our file and see that if we do an update that it also takes into account the update three replicas commit found files about yaml deploy about yaml finished so we now we have the second webhook and kubectl get pods we have three pods so i kind of wrote a whole ci cd here in just a few lines because you also have CI CD systems that kind of take your Git repository and then ingest these files and put them in Kubernetes. So that's kind of what we did now. So we rewrote some of these systems that do that for you in Kubernetes. So this is our working version. But then in the next lecture, I'm going to have to move this within the cluster because it's still running outside our cluster with this ngrok. If you then put it in the cluster, then you can make it a complete service itself that runs within your Kubernetes cluster and monitors your Git repository, your GitHub repository to see if there are any files that need to deploy. Now that we successfully tested our GitHub deploy locally, I'm going to run it within a deployment on my Kubernetes cluster. So if we have another look to our main.yaml, this get client had the parameter false because we want it to be not within the cluster. So I'm going to change it to true. And now it will expect us to be within the cluster. So this code will be executed instead of the cube config. Another approach could be instead of this flag to check whether this file exists. And if this file exists, then we are outside the cluster. If it doesn't exist, then we are probably in the cluster and then you should load the in cluster config. That would also work. So I'm just going to keep it simple now. So get client true. We are within the cluster. Go run dot go or go run dot will hopefully say something. Yeah. Unable to load the in cluster configuration, Kubernetes service host, Kubernetes service port is not defined. So these are the environment variables that it looks for, and these are defined within the pod to then contact the Kubernetes service. It will contact the Kubernetes service, and if you contact the Kubernetes service, it's just the REST API. And this REST API, if you just contact it like that, then you don't have any permissions to create pods or do anything. So we will still need to give our pod permissions to create a deployment and we can do that using a service account. So let's have a look at this deploy.yaml, this YAML definitions that I created to have our GitHub deploy application, the application that we wrote in the previous lecture to have deployed on a Kubernetes cluster. So if we start from the top, we also have deployment. I call it GitHub deploy. So we have the label app is GitHub deploy, one replica for now. And we have a service account name. So I will create a service account called GitHub deploy and I will attach the permissions to it. We have a container, the name is GitHub deploy and the image is Vartviana GitHub deploy. So if you want to deploy your own GitHub deploy, you will need a Docker container repository. You could use Docker Hub, that's what I'm using. And then this is your login of Docker Hub. And then this is the repository. So create this first, this Docker Hub account. And then you can build and push it to your Docker Hub account to have it available. 
I'm going to show you in a second how we're going to build this Docker container, but you will need your own Docker Hub account to be able to push this image. The port, I give the name, it's called the HTTP port. You don't really have to give it a name, but I gave it a name. And the container port is 8080 because we run on 8080. I specify two environment variables because we don't really want to have this in our code that we're going to push to GitHub. So I said GitHub token comes from a secret. So we'll still have to create the secret. The secret name is going to be GitHub deploy and the key GitHub token. And here the key will be webhook secret. So what Kubernetes is going to do is it's going to have a look in the secret and inject these values in our pods. So this is basically our deployment we would still need some other resources to get this working. So we have another resource, a service, also called GitHub Deploy. We say it needs to be on port 8080, and this is going to be how we're going to contact our application, our GitHub Deploy outside our cluster, because it is of type load balancer. If you deploy this on AWS or Google Cloud with their Kubernetes offerings, then this load balancer will, in case of AWS, create an AWS load balancer, and then you will have a public host name that you can then configure as a webhook. I'm going to use a Minikube because that's the easiest way to run a development environment. And you can still use a load balancer in Minikube. You just have to enter a command to tunnel this. You can enter Minikube tunnel, which I also will show you. That will then create a link between your local machine and this service and then you can still use ngrok to expose it. Then we have the service account, GitHub deploy, and then we have a role. So this role is necessary to give us the correct permissions. So we have this API group apps. If you scroll down to our deploy, you see client apps v1. This is actually apps API group, and then the resource is deployments, and this is our deployments here. So this follows nicely the same structure. And then the verbs that we are going to use, get, list, watch, create, update, patch, delete. It's a bit too much for what we need, but then we are sure. Here we use create, update, and also in this wait for pods, we do a list, but that's then on the pods, which I didn't give permissions for because we are not using it here, but you could add it as well. In that case, the API group is empty. And then we have the role binding. So the role binding is going to link this role with this service account. It's also called GitHub deploy. So it says the subject is the service account and the role is the GitHub deploy. So that's it. So we have the role binding to link those two, the service account and the role. We have a service and then we have the deployment that also contains this service account name. So that it's linked with the service account. And then we have the secrets. So what do we still need to do? We need to push our container and we need to create our secrets. Let's try to start with this container. I have created a Docker file here. So this is a pretty generic Docker file that is going to package our Golang program into a Docker image. So you need to have Docker installed to be able to build this. There's Docker available for Windows, Mac and Linux. So you can just download and install it if you don't have it yet. What are we going to do? We're going to take the official Golang image, we're going to download it, and we're going to use this as the Go Builder. We're going to create a new directory and cd into this directory. It's the GitHub deploy directory we are going to use. This is just to compile our program. So to compile our program, we need to copy everything from our current working directory, everything that is right here, into our container. And we also have a docker ignore file and it's going to ignore the YAML definition and the uh, Git, so we don't have to upload the Git into our Docker container. Then we're going to install curl and Git because we need it for the go get to work, and then we're going to build it. Because we are on Alpine, which is a slimmed down version, it's still Linux, but we need to disable CGO. So we just have a few flags here so that it works on Alpine Linux, because this is the 118 Alpine, if you don't want to use Alpine, you can just remove this, this Alpine, but then you wouldn't be able to use the APK add because this APK add is specific to Alpine. If you remove this Alpine and you have a normal Linux distribution, I think it's a Debian based, so then you would have to use apt-get. 
So we here we build it. We build our Golang into a single binary using this line go build and our output will be github deploy. So in the github deploy working directory, we have a file github deploy, which is our binary. Then we're going to start another container, just an Alpine container. So it's very minimal. There's nothing in it. And we're going to add CR certificates, bash and curl. So these, these things are very handy for debugging and also CA certificates is necessary for make outgoing calls and verify TLS certificates. Then we're going to say copy from the Go Builder this GitHub deploy executable into slash GitHub deploy. So we will just have one image with one file extra, this file, which is our executable. And then when we start our container, we'll execute this executable GitHub deploy. Let's try to build this docker build i'm going to give it a tag and this tag is necessary to push it to my docker hub account and let's have a look this needs to be the same docker build t ward viana github deploy and what do i want to build i want to build my current directory so i'm just gonna put the dot so now it's building and the build is finished so you see all the steps here my steps are cached because this is not the first time that I run it. If I don't want to use a cache, no cache, which you don't need, but I just want to show you the full output. Now you see downloading the dependencies and installing everything. And now the build will also take a little bit longer than the cached build. And then if I would do a Docker build again without this flag, then it will go quicker again because now I already built it. The next step is to push it to our Docker Hub. This is Docker Hub, hub.docker.com. And then if you don't have an account yet, you can create a new account here, or you can sign in to sign in with your own account. My account is hub.docker.com slash u slash wardviana. And here you can see I pushed this GitHub deploy. I'll push it again just to make sure that I have the latest version and then we can start using it. So how do I push this image? First, you need to run Docker login. Docker login will ask you the credentials for Docker Hub so that you can push your Docker image to your own account. So I do Docker push and then the name of my image. It will take this Docker image that I just built and send it to GitHub. And now within our Kubernetes cluster, we can use it. So this will take a few seconds to get pushed. The next step is to create these secrets. To create these secrets, you can use a kubectl command. I'd rather use this GitHub create secret command than having them hard coded in here because this deployed YAML, I'm then going to push to GitHub. So that way we can enter a command that is not visible in Git and then have still our definition in Git. So this is finished. Let's try to start our Minikube cluster and then create this secret. So I need to start this Minikube cluster always again because what I do is I do a Minikube delete to then start from a clean Minikube cluster. So my Minikube is running. I'm gonna create this secret with kubectl create secret. It's a generic secret. So if you have a look at the help, then you can create a Docker registry, a generic or TLS. So I'm going to create a generic one. And then I'll make sure that this command is also in a readme in my GitHub for this demo. I need to add these flags from literal and then key equals value. So the webhook secret is my secret and the GitHub token is this token that I just created again. Oh, and then you also need to add a name. So kubectl create secret generic and then the name is the github deploy because we refer here to the name and then it created a secret kubectl get secret if we then have a look at the secret then you see the actual input the data key value and the value is base64 encoded webhook secret and then again the value so this should work. Let's try to deploy this. kubectl apply of this deployed HTML. 
This creates deployment, the service, service account, the role and the role binding. One deploy, one pod and one service. How do we then access this service from our host system? Because this is of type load balancer, we can use a minikube tunnel. A minikube tunnel will create a tunnel between my host system and the service that is of type load balancer. So if you're using minikube, you can follow the same steps. If you are on a real cluster, then using this service load balancer will spin up a cluster that also gives you a host name that should be accessible. Start a tunnel for GitHub deploy. We need to keep this window open. So I'm just going to open another bash window. Curl localhost 8080, page not found. Okay, so this is our service within our Kubernetes that we are hitting now. So let's now run ngrok again. ngrok hp8080. And now ngrok, instead of going to this local instance, it will go to our minikube tunnel. And our minikube tunnel will go to the service. The service will go to the pod. And in the end, we get to our real application. This URL changed, so I need to copy paste this again as a webhook. Go deploy Kubernetes GitHub, settings, webhook. I can delete my old webhook. Actually, I didn't have to delete it. I could have just updated it actually, but it doesn't matter. Webhook secret is my secret. Just send the push event and then add the webhook. And now I don't get the correct. Now I don't get the correct. Ah, it just took some time. So I did a post and yeah, now the last delivery was successful. Let's have a look in the logs to be sure. I'm going to open another window. Oh, look, we did our post gave us a 500 kubectl log get pods let's have a look in the logs there's nothing in the logs but the delivery was correct so let's continue and see what happens when we do the webhook there is still a possibility that i didn't that i didn't properly use this github hook or that we get a validate payload error because there is also a backslash and missing here so let's just continue for now let's see how it goes code m.yml so if we trigger here a change then it will trigger our webhook so i made a change let's go and have a look in our webhook webhook you can click on it recent deliveries Okay, so we have two and we can see the event you see. So we have the repository, the owner, and so we have this commits array in here. Here it is commits where we have the modified apple.yml and we can then send this apple.yml to our Kubernetes cluster. So let's have a look whether this worked or not. kubectl get pods and yes, I have my pod running kube cdl get deploy and I have my deploy running there's just one pod let's try to run three of them then I just need to make one change in my code m.yml three replicas commit and now we have three and three pods. Let's now have a look at the logs. kubectl get logs of this. Oh, we still get this event not found. That's why we had this 500 error. GitHub hook was the event not found. So maybe there's still something wrong here. Most likely the type is still of a different version. So that's why it's not working. And also it was not displaying immediately because I also don't have a backslash n here. These logs might have not have shown if there was no new line. But then 
when the webhook triggered, we found the files and then we did the deploy. So this is the most important. Here, we definitely want to capture this first event, but even if we don't capture this first event, nothing is really going to happen. I will try to update the correct code in my GitHub repository so that you also have the correct code there. It's probably going to be something small. So now we have this working. So we have these logs here, the deploy, the webhook works. We have ngrok that we have two times the states okay. And we have the mini cube tunnel that we set up for GitHub deploy. So we now really have our application running within Kubernetes. And you can also go and have a look inside this pod by using kubectl exec. And then because we installed bash, you can also enter bash. And then we can have a look what is running here. So we have this GitHub deploy running, and that's really our only binary that we have put in this image. And the reason why it can contact our Kubernetes server is because we have somewhere these Kubernetes service defined. And then if we curl to this IP address using HTTPS, then you can see that we are actually, well, I'll just clear the screen for a second. We can actually contact this API server and you see if you don't use any user, then we have anonymous and then we get forbidden. And that's why we needed this service account. And this service account is then somewhere mounted within our pod run secret Kubernetes IO service account. That's probably going to be it. And then here we have the CA certificate and also we're going to have something to authenticate a token most likely or another certificate so that we can assume this service account. We can connect to this API and then we have the role to do this get list, watch, create, update, patch or delete. And that's what this Go SDK does for us. So this get client here, this rest in cluster config is going to take this environment variable and see if we can contact the Kubernetes cluster using this secret of our service account. And that's why we don't have to do all these steps ourselves. So that's it for this lecture. If you're deploying this in a real cluster, you're going to have a real host name that you can then use and that you can expose your application and then you don't have to use ngrok. So the only downside here with Minikube is that you have to use a lot of steps to get to your actual pod. But if you would use a real production cluster, then you don't need all these steps. This was quite a long demo. I hope when you try this demo yourself, it also works for you. If not, reach out to me in the Q&A or send me a message. In this lecture, I'm going to show you how to create SSH keys. You can and probably already created SSH keys using either PuttyGen in Windows or SSH keygen in Linux or Mac. But you can actually have Golang also create your SSH keys for you. And that's what I'm going to show you in this lecture. I'm going to create it as a package so that we later on can use this package in other lectures because some cloud APIs like AWS allow you to create a key with their SDK or their API calls, but that is not the case with every SDK. So you might want to know how to create those SSH keys in Golang itself. I already wrote my main function so that we don't have to go over that anymore. What do I do here? I have a private key, public key of the type bind, and I'm going to call it generate keys. And the generate keys function is going to return a private key and public key. And then I'm just going to write the mykey.pem and the mykey.pub in my current directory so that I have those keys ready to later on do something with it. I'm using this package, which is also defined in my Go mod. So whatever I put in my directory here will then be within the package. So it's a very simple layout. I just have my current directory that will contain my Go files. So here I have package SSH, generate keys, and it will then return this private key and public key. So here I have SSH, which is this package. 
which I initialized right here. So I did a go mod init of my current directory. So this current directory here is the package and this is called package SSH. I then have this CMD keygen with the main go in, but this is just as a test to have an executable. If you only wanted a package, then you could even remove the CMD, just have keygen, just have this function, generate keys, and then you could import this from any external package and just use it the way you would like. So generate keys, and then I'm gonna write it to my local files. To make this work, I still need to write this generate keys. So what is an SSH key? This SSH key that we want to create is of format RSA. We actually have an RSA package in Golang that can generate this key for us. So from crypto RSA, we have this generate key. We need to supply a random source and we need to say how long it needs to be. And then it will reply this private key. So this is fairly easy. I can just say rand reader and then it will import from crypto the rand reader. So make sure that you are using crypto rand and not any other rand package because the crypto rand is actually the safe package to cryptographically secure generate a random number. You can choose how long it is. I'm going to pick 4096, which should be enough currently to have a decent key size. This returns an RSA private key and error. So our private key error is RSA generate key. If there is an error, we can return an error. Generate key error. And then, and then we have this private key. But this private key is of RSA private key. We need a PEM formatted key to be able to load it using the SSH command or to import it as an open SSH key in PuTTY. So with PuTTY, you would have to use PuTTY again to import an open SSH formatted key. Here, we will be able to use the SSH command because the SSH command supports open SSH format. It supports this PEM format. With PuTTY, you would need an extra step. Private key, so this is just the bind, but we still need to convert into PEM format. So there's also a PEM package in Golang. So we can say private key PEM equals, and then we have PEM, and here we can generate a PEM block, and then it will import the encoding PEM package. This block is a struct, which has a type headers and bytes. So the type is going to be RSA private key. We use curly brackets because it's not a function, it's, it's a struct. Type is gonna be RSA private key. And then we have the bytes. The headers are optional, so we have the bytes, the decoded bytes of the contents. Typically a DER encoded ASN1 structure. So what does that mean? That we still need to convert our private key, which is just bytes, into a format that PEM would accept. So we have the bytes. And to convert this to the format that is acceptable for PEM, we can use the X509 package. And this X509 package has a Marshall PKS CS1 private key converts an RSA private key to the PKCS format. So th this is the ASN1 DER format. And this is the kind of key commonly encoded in PEM blocks of type RSA private key. So to know all these things, you can read the documentation or you can just find some examples on the internet and read what all these functions do. So we pass the RSA private key here and it will return bytes. So now we have a PEM block that we can already return. So this is private key pem block. And if we would do private key pem dot bytes types or header, then it would just only return one of these parts, the bytes or the types or the header that is empty. So we need another function to return this, to parse this whole pem block and then return it as bytes. And this function is called the PEM encode to memory and this accepts a PEM block and returns 
then bytes. And we also apply our private key. And then we still need to get the public key and the public key needs to be in a format that OpenSSH can work with. So we're going to use the SSH package for that. The SSH package is not included by default, so we need to import it using goget. Goget will download it and then we can add it here, golang.org, the crypto SSH package. And then we should be able to use the SSH dot. And we need a public function, new public key. New public key takes an RSA public key, which we have in the private key. So we have private key and in the private key, we have a public key because when you generate a new key, it generates a private and a public key. It's a pointer. So let's pass it as a reference. And then we get back an SSH public key that we can then use public key and the error. And then if there's an error, we return the error, new public key error. And public key is of type SSH public key. So again, we need to parse this public key into a format that we can use, like the authorized keys format, if you're familiar with that. So what we're going to do is SSH package has a Marshall authorized key and this accepts the public key. Save this. So these are the lines to generate a key, create this pen block. This is the, how the pen block looks like, but it will have the RSA private key here on, in the top. And then from this private key that, we, that also is associated with the public key, we'll do the new public key from the public key, which will then give us the authorized key format. So let me just show you how that looks like. We save this, go run cmd keygen main.go. We're going to run the generate keys and then we're going to write my key pump and my key pub. So now I should see those two appearing. The mykey.pem is the begin RSA private key, then you have the key here, and end RSA private key. The public key that is associated with it starts with SSH RSA, and then is the public key, this is the public SSH key for this private key. So now we can use this format for our authorized keys when we need to work with SSH. So this PEM format, when you have this and you're on Windows, you need PuttyGen to convert this to a Putty private key. I actually have PuttyGen here. So this is PuttyGen for Mac. On Windows you have UI. But what you can do here is then convert a private key to the Putty private key format. So Putty, PuttyGen and then mykey.pem, which is the input. The output is a putty private key, so it's minus capital O private, and then you need to specify the output file, mykey.ppk. And this would then convert my open SSH format, mykey.pem, from the open SSH format, or the, they call it open SSH format in putty, I think, but it's just the RSA private key, the PEM format, into the PuTTY format. And this is the PuTTY user key file that you can then use in PuTTY. In the next few lectures, I'm going to show you how to use SSH in Go. So in the previous lecture, we just create the SSH keys, which was fairly simple. You just output the private key and the public key. Now I want to show you how the interaction between the client and the server works. To fully comprehend how SSH works, it is actually better to first write the server and then the client to see all the complexities. SSH itself is quite complex and even with the library there are a lot of things to show you that you have to take into account even when writing the client. How does a connection work between our client and our server? We are going to do authentication using a server key, the mykey.pem. 
and our server will then have the mykey.pub, the public key of our private key, which is also called the authorized keys. If you have a server running with SSHD, then you will for sure come across this. So this is the authentication part. I have the private key and the server has the public key to verify that I have the private key. And then we can start communicating using the SSH v2 protocol. So it's not going to use those keys anymore. It's going to create new keys to do the actual encryption. The keys that we are going to use is only for authentication. And also on the client side is also going to verify whether the server is really the server that we expect if we have the server.pub, the public key of the server. And this is typically the known host if you're using putty or the SSH client. The first time you connect, you will be prompted whether you trust this server, which is basically asking whether you want to save this public key locally. And from that point on, you have this public key. And if then the server would change its private certificate or it would be another server, then you would know. So if we are going to write our client in SSH in Go, then we can already supply this server.pub because we know this upfront, which is also the most secure way to verify whether the server is really the server it claims. So this is the authentication in a nutshell. I'm first going to start to build this SSH server and then we will have a look at the client. So in the meantime that we don't have the Go client, you will have to use an SSH client. I'm just going to use SSH in macOS, which is OpenSSH, which you can also download on Windows if you don't have it. So try it out and see if you have the SSH command. If not, you can download OpenSSH for Windows as well. You can also use PuTTY, but for PuTTY, as I explained in the previous lecture, you would have to convert the private key to be able to log in to the server. This demo of this SSH server brings together lots of different concepts like how to do networking and how to work with asynchronous calls. So it's actually quite an interesting demo that brings together a lot of things. I already wrote my main function, the server may not go, and my main function will read the mykey.pub, which is necessary to allow the client certificate and the server.pem, which is the server certificate that we still need to create. So let me start by creating these certificates. So if I do go run cmd keygen keygen.go, this will generate the mykey.pem and the mykey.pub. So this one I don't need anymore. And this I'm going to rename into the server.pem. And then always you need to rename the public key as well. Because the public key and the private key need to match, they go together. And that's going to be our server.pem and our server.pub. And I'm just going to run this keygen again. And then we're going to have our mykey.pem and pub, which is going to be used by the client eventually. And then I'm going to include this package, the SSH package. In the SSH package, we have the start server and the start server is defined in the server.go. Going to pass this private key and the authorized keys. So the authorized keys is basically one or more public keys that we want to give access to in our SSH server. So how do we start writing this SSH server? Well, again, there's an SSH package. So let's have a look at this SSH package. So this is the SSH package and there are a lot of functions. If you think about on a high level, what we need to do is we need to parse our public key or our public keys. We need to parse our private key and then we need to build a config and then we need to start a server. So here you also have the client implementation, but we are really looking for the server implementation. So the best way to figure out, I find, is to have a look at the examples. Here you have a lot of examples. We have the client example, a dial example, which is also going to be for the client. And then we have the new server connection. So this is going to be accepting new connections. So this is what we're going to need. And here we already have quite an evolved example with different examples. You have a password callback if you want to do password authentication. And then you have a public key callback. And then then it opens a port 
And then you have then this new server connection, this SSH new server connection. And then you and then you have the code to handle your request. So let's try to write this from scratch. And we start by parsing our authorized keys. So let's take this bit first because this example we can already use. We need to import our authorized keys and this code block will make sure that we can do that. So we have the authorized keys, which is a byte and then authorized keys map. So we're going to store it in a map and this is our authorized key. So we're just going to replace this authorized keys. Well, we're not going to do a fatal. So we're going to change this into a return of an error. Parse authorized keys error. And then the way this works is, let me try to save this first. I just need to add the error here. So we are going to declare a map and the key is going to be our authorized key and the bool just that we have it. So we're going to put everything to true. That way we also don't have duplicates. So as long as there's data, as long as there's bytes in authorized keys, then we're going to parse the authorized key using this authorized keys. And this is going to be our public key that we extract. And in the rest, there might be more public keys. We only pass one, but we could pass more. So this example actually already takes into account that you could have more. And as long, because this is a for loop, as long that you have more keys in there, then we're going to parse more keys and then put these keys in our authorized map. So you see here, this is our public key. This is the rest, what is left over. We put the string of this public key we put in our map. We assign it true to it. And then we say what is left over, we put in our authorized keys. So if you're only using one key, it will do one iteration. Then rest will be empty. We assign empty to authorized keys and then we are finished. Then we can already start building our SSH config. So this is the SSH config, the SSH server config that we are going to use. And let's copy paste this and let's have a look what we need to change here. So we don't want password authentication. We rather just want to use keys so we can remove this. And it actually says in the comments, remove this to disable password auth. And we're just going to use public key authentication. So the public key callback is a function. And this is the function that's going to validate whether our public key is correct. And we have this authorized keys map that contains all our public keys. So we are going to return this SSH permission. And then we can add this extension if you want. So record public key used for authentication. So then later on, you could perhaps use it. So then we return this SSH permission if our authentication is granted, because if this key exists in this map, then it's granted. And otherwise we are going to say it's an unknown public key. So this is our authentication part. We have this SSH package taking care of all these things. Now we would like to start our server. And to start our server, the server itself to create the networking socket is not implemented in this package, which is actually quite smart because then they don't have to take care of that. It actually uses the implementation of the networking in Golang itself. So it's going to use a net package. And that you see here. So here we have this net listen. And this will open port 2022, or you can give it another port. And then we can accept connections. We still need to parse our private key as well. We don't need to read it anymore. So we don't need this code, but we need the parse private key. So parse private key, we're going to add this private key to our config. We're going to start the server. And then if there's a new connection, then we can accept it. And then once it is accepted, we still need to do something with this connection. We need to make sure that the SSH package is going to send the correct data and respond to the correct data using the SSH protocol. So that's why we need this new server connection. And this new server connection uses this listener that accepts connections and also needs this config. And then it gives us a lot of variables that we can then work with to communicate with our clients. So let's copy all this. Paste this. 
and then we need to maybe change a few lock fatal f's let's start from the top parse private key private key so now we have a ssh signer type that we need then we add the host key which accepts the ssh signer now we load the server.pem the private key in our config and then once the server config has been configured the connections can be accepted net needs to be imported i'm going to save this now net is imported you can put it on a different port if you like and then we'll say parse private key error listen error and then we'll also say accept error listener listener accept error and then this is the most important function this new server connection new server connection starts a new ssh server with c as underlying transport so it does the handshake and if the handshake is unsuccessful it will close and return an error the request and new channels must be serviced or the connection will hang so that we'll do afterwards let's just see if he would be able to log in so i'm just gonna remove these variables for now and we'll see if we can start the server failed to handshake or i'll just call it new server con error and then we're gonna print something if it's successful okay go run server.go allow so now our server is running and then like i said you can download open sh for windows if you don't have the sh command or you can use putty localhost and then you need to pass the p flag before or after localhost to indicate what port you want to connect to and then you might actually get this error remote host identification has changed so if you already have for localhost on port 2022 you already have a public key in your system then you might want to remove that if you ever connected to localhost on this port it will already have a private key and then it will say okay you already have a public key in your system and this is going to be in the known host files because it tries to connect and it wants to check the public key of the server and the public key of the server is different what we already have in a known host and if it's different it's just going to say that there's a problem so you want to either remove this or change the port so i'm going to remove this so i now removed the last line of this file and then i'm going to try again connection refused because what happened our server stopped working because we are not really in a loop here we are just only accepting one single connection and if that connection fails or that connection is in use we're not doing anything anymore so we will need to add a for loop here to make to make sure it keeps on running so maybe let's do that first so we listen to this port this only needs to happen once but then we want to keep on accepting we want to keep on accepting clients so we're just going to make a for loop of it and then we also need to make sure that we don't exit just like that so our returns might actually just need to be printf printf here if you have an error our server will just print it instead of exiting and then the server can just run forever basically until we hit Control c or something and then we don't need this return anymore so this will run forever until the process gets killed or we hit Control c or something let's try it again go run and what is happening now is that it's not iterating over this loop constantly this is actually blocking so as long as we don't have anyone connecting to our server we are just stuck at this line just waiting waiting until someone connects if someone connects then we will do the next lines so now we cannot establish the authenticity of this host so we are going to say yes we would like to do that and then we will not get this warning anymore because then the public key will be saved within within our known hosts 
Okay, what happened here? We didn't supply a private key yet. So our server crashed somewhere. Ah, yeah, it crashed here. Because we don't have these extensions pub key because we are not logged in. Because these extensions is only set when we are logged in. So let's try to check for this. If con permissions is not equal to nil, then we can output this, I guess. Let's try it out. Let's try to connect again. That didn't work either because our connection is probably nil. So if connection is not equal to nil and connection permissions is not equal to nil, then we're going to output it. Okay, that's much better. New server connection, SSH, no auth passed yet, unknown public key for Edward Viana, which is my login here. So this SSH client uses Edward Viana by default as my login. Unknown public key for Edward Viana. Let's try to pass this key, the mykey.pam, which is our private key. And then we are logged in. Logged in with key SHA256 and then this fingerprint. So now we are logged in, but we cannot do anything. It is even blocked, even control C doesn't work anymore. So you would have to probably click this trash to get rid of it if you would like to close it now. So it's completely blocked because we are not doing anything yet. We need to handle this connection. We need to do still with something with this connection. We would like to probably give them the user a terminal to then type something. So let's close this, the server. And now the client's also closed. And let's try to see if we can do something within the connection. There's still some code that we can use from the example. So we need to define here the channel, the requests, and then we can use those variables. The incoming request channel must be serviced. So that was already something that this new server connection was saying that once the client is connected, then we need to service this connection. And that we do with go, which means it will run in the background, SSH discard request rex. So let's add that and then service the incoming channel. And this is where we get into the protocol details. Channels have a type depending on the application level protocol intended. In the case of a shell, the type is session and the server shell may be used to present a simple terminal interface. So we are indeed going to present a simple terminal interface to our SSH client because that's what our SSH client will ask for. So let's copy paste this and let's start with that. So I copy pasted this. I need an extra curly bracket here at the end. Need to chan, chan, chance and rex needs to be defined again. So let's try to identify what is really happening here. So the new surf connection replies us this new channel and new requests. And they are in Golang of type channel. And when it is defined like this channel with a less than and a dash, then it's a read only channel. So this is a read only channel that we are getting back. And this is not a read only channel. So we cannot write to this channel, but we can listen to this channel. So what's going to happen here? The incoming request channel must be serviced. So that is the package that asks us that whenever we do a new service connection, then we need, it needs to be serviced. So this servicing we do with go SSH discard requests. And this card request in the background will consume and reject all requests from the past in channel. I don't know myself exactly all the details why this is necessary, but it's in the package documentation. So we're just going to use what they tell us to use. And this discard requests will listen to what is happening on this request channel. And then it's going to do what it needs to do to make the protocol work. And it will do that in the background. What are we going to do? We are going to listen on the incoming channel. So in SSH, you have concept channel and in Golang, you have a concept channel. So that's why it's a bit confusing. This channel is of new channel. So for every new channel in SSH, 
you're going to listen to this go channel. So this go channel basically means that we are going to wait here. We are going to listen to this channel in go. And if there's a new variable in it, the variable of type SSH new channel, we're going to go into this loop and then we're going to have this new channel variable. So for every new channel that is created in this SSH connection, we're going to have an iteration in this loop. Then channels have a type, and if the channel type is not a session, then we are just going to reject it because we are only going to implement these session types. And when we connect with the our SSH client, we only need this session channel type to respond to because the session channel type that's what's going to open a terminal for us or we're going to implement the terminal that is going to open when the client is asking for this new channel of type channel type so if it's of type channel we're going to accept it here we rejected it if it's not not session then we reject it otherwise we're going to accept it and once we accept it then we have the channel the requests and errors so here again i'm going to just print print this if we cannot accept the channel and what is then going to happen we then can respond to requests so within a session channel we can then respond to request so you can have a shell request or you can have a PTY request or you can have an nth request and then in the example it's only going to handle shell requests and we are going to change it a little bit so this runs in the background because this function has the keyword go so it's going to run in the background and then it's going to go again to the for loop and then here it's going to wait for if there's a different channel so if there's only one channel we're only going to iterate it once and then it will just be kind of stuck here but if it's stuck here, then we will never be able to accept another connection while we are dealing with our current connection. So ideally, we would run this also in the background. So we can make another asynchronous function, go handle connection. And this handle connection will need the channel, but probably also the connection. So this chance is of new channel. So I'm going to pass this. And then I'm also going to pass a connection because we might need that later. Oh, but this needs to be just chance. And then, and then I just need this in the function signature of handle connection. So I'm going to create handle connection, handle connection connection is of SSH server con and then we have this chance chance and this is of new channel so I'm going to put this here this is going to be my new function that runs asynchronous and then all this stuff here this for loop this is going to be in my function and here it will go all the way back to this for a loop and then it will accept new connections so this is how this asynchronous works so now we have this in the function i'm going to save this so then this runs in the background for every connection that we have and it will iterate over the multiple channels so if there's a new channel it will just iterate over the next one this we are not using yet so i'm just gonna put an underscore here and then I want to know what requests that this SSH client is going to make. So let's do the following for requests. I'm just going to say requests made by client and then the request type. Request type made by client. And then we can see what we have to implement. Let's see if this works. Allow. We are logged in. And then when we are making our requests, then there's a request made by client, PTI request, and request, and a shell request. 
and only the shell request was accepted because here we do a request reply so here we have this request state request we do a reply and if it's of type shell then we're going to say true so we're going to reply true here this is a boolean reply sends a response to a request to a request so if it is shell then we can say okay you can get a shell but then we get this error pti allocation request failed on shell zero so ideally we also want to reply yes if we have a request for a pty rec so again this is like ssh protocol so you see you make a connection it asks three things so you would have to implement those three so what did i maybe not explain yet so this function here so you have the go this runs asynchronous so that we can go to the next channel if there is one this has a function and the function input is the ssh request so this is the request the request is of type channel so this is another read-only channel this function will be executed straight away because this anonymous function runs in the background will be requests will be passed so here we have request is then called in and then when there's a new request when there's a new request a new sh request that is being put on the channel then we are going to run this for loop so this for loop will run indefinitely within this function in the background for every new request that, there, that there is coming in so here we have three requests so we run it three times this loop for every request that was being put on the channel the next step would be that if we get this request of pti request or shell that we provide our client here with a terminal and a terminal is basically comes from a long time ago in unix where you would have terminals but this is still implemented within ssh and other programs where you have a terminal and in a terminal you open a shell for example these are also two terminals here and they support things like resizing and your cursor can basically move so to implement this ourselves would be quite some work so in golang we also have a terminal package that we can use Let's try first with a switch right here on rec type. So if rec type. Oh, and <laughs> you can see there was a request made for a window change. So you see, depending on what we do, there might be some more requests being made. You can implement all of them if you would like, but that's not really the goal of this demo. The goal is to have just something working so that we can experiment with sending commands. Because what do you do typically between servers? You often just want to connect to a server, execute some commands, see what is happening, and then exit. And this is typically what you need within automation jobs. You just need to send a command, or you might even have to run a server, like an SSH server, that can receive commands. So that's what really we want to build here using Go and within our function where we here get the request to open a shell. We kind of want to give a shell and then maybe implement some commands. So first we need to open this terminal. So we're going to use this terminal package for it. If we receive shell, then there will be certain actions. If there is PTI request, there will be certain actions. And then there will be a default where we don't really implement that. And then we can just say, we don't implement it so we say we reply false and here we reply true so here in pti request i'm going to open my terminal and then even env might capture and say we implement this there's also a payload by the way so even we could capture this payload which is bytes so in case of env then there might be some environment variables being passed let's keep it simple for now let's try to implement this terminal and for this start terminal we need a new package so i'm gonna do go get golang x term and we're going to use this x term package term provides support functions for dealing with terminals as commonly found on unix systems let's try to implement that and we're going to put that in a new function create terminal 
and we're going to pass our connection and our channel channel was the one that we got returned here so channel channel connection it just depends what you need but we need for to create a terminal we need this connection and channel so we're going to say connection channel what are we going to return maybe not yet anything maybe an error later connection is of ssh server connection and channel is of type ssh channel term dot new terminal and where are we going to open this new terminal so this channel is actually a read or writer so this channel this sh channel implements read write and close so we can use this interface read writer that can read and write to this variable channel so this is a ssh channel so this is not a golang channel anymore this is just an ssh channel that we can write to send data and receive data so we are going to say open me as a channel using this term package and we're going to have a prompt this is going to be a prompt then we have terminal instance that is being returned the term terminal then this channel also needs a defer channel close so when the function is finished we are going to close our terminal and then we want to do something with this terminal this terminal instance also has a function read line so read line whenever our user using our ssh client is going to type something then we want to read this line read line and error so read line is going to be blocking so we want to do that in a separate go function and we want to keep on doing this so we're going to make a loop so we're going to have this loop here and then as long as our channel is open we're going to wait for new lines if there's an error what should we do when there's an error maybe escape the function or maybe just print it let's print it read line error just so that we have all the error logs and let's then break the function the break the for loop and then the function will close then we have line let's use another switch and what should we check for case i'll just try to come up with something who am i which is not the same as the who am i command in linux but we can just use it as an example command so who am i then it returns a login here we can say who am i and then we can send a response default we can say that we didn't understand this and then we can send it back to the client so how do you return something let's have a look in this term instance and there's term instance dot write and we can just write a buffer and this will return the amount of bytes written and an error but yeah let's just keep it simple for now we could capture all the output and all the errors but let's just try to find and forget to see if there's anything working you are and then that's why i also send this connection you are and you need to do an s print maybe so that it's nicely formatted you are s what are you connection dot connection dot user and if it's default we will say we will say command not found and if you just press enter then the line is going to be empty we don't do anything we just keep it empty so we have a switch close our for loop and then we have a go function and our go function needs to be executed as well but there's no argument so i'm just going to put these brackets here and then our go function will automatically be executed immediately 
if r is not equals to nil. This looks pretty good. So let's try to see what's happening. So we are in a channel, new channel is being created of type session. We accept a new channel. Then we get a SSH channel returned and this request. So this request we can then use. So if there's a new request, then we'll go in here. Then we'll be waiting here for those new requests. This in is an SSH request. If there's a new request, then this will fire. And it will say request type made by client. And if the request is PTI rec, then we create a terminal. And actually, because this is in the background, it will also just continue here all the way to the beginning. And then it will wait until there's a new channel to be opened. So everything is pretty asynchronous. And we could even have more code here if you want to execute it just when the client connects and it didn't make any requests. So then it will create a terminal. Term instance is our terminal. So this will start a terminal and then it will give us like, like here we have the dollar sign, it will give us a greater than sign. We'll make sure the channel is closed at some point. Read line, who am I? And what is this? A sprint F. It is. And then if we don't understand the command, we'll say command not found. So then we have a little shell that we can try out. So this is not really a shell comparable with bash like we have here. So the user cannot really do anything. It just has this little shell that we interpret the commands and can then execute something. So this can be nice when you have a server that users need to log in to certain actions. Server is running. Oh, and connection is immediately closed. And I get a read line error because it's end of, oh, and I see what I did. I put a defer channel close here, and then it's executed when this function is finished, because this create terminal function will finish, but then this go function here is separate, and it will finish later. So it is this defer, I want to have it in my, go function which will keep on running forever so only when we have an error for example a read line error we will break and then when we come here at the end then the channel will close that's what we want let's try that again allow ah, this seems to be working better we made this request three times we say okay we can make request but only once we executed something and then we have a shell. And what does that mean to have a shell? I can type something. I can go left. I can go right. I can do, 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 remove my letters. I can say ls. Okay, command not found. So all these commands are not found because I am just checking here with my read line what commands I'm sending. If I press enter, then it's a case of empty. Let's now try who am I? You are Edward Fianna because that's the user that I connected with. How do I exit here? Control C, and then you see the other read line error, and then you go out. Or what I can also do is I can also make another case for quit. And then I can say goodbye on the terminal. Goodbye. And then we're gonna close it. And how do we close it? Channel close. We're gonna close this channel. Let's try this again. I'll, uh, mm, nice. And we try who am I? And quit. Quit says goodbye. Connection closed. So that also works. That's pretty nice. So we now have created with Go with just two packages that are from golang.org, which means that they are from Golang, but they just don't follow the stability promise that they have because these are very stable. Here, the APIs could change a little bit, but those packages are very reliable still. We only use two packages, the SSH package and the term package. One is for the SSH client and server, and one is for the terminal support. So you see, using the default packages and just some easy to use concepts, we have written a complete SSH server that opens a terminal where you can enter some commands, interpret those commands, 
and then execute some code. You could also execute commands in the background based on what you are getting here, or you could even pipe everything to a shell, but that's not the point of this server. We just want to have a shell where you can just type some commands. So this is nice to have to then test our Golang client. But when we are going to use our Golang client, we just want to send one single command. We don't really want to have our full shell. And this is also supported within the SSH client because you can also add commands here. You can also add commands and those commands will be executed. But the way that the SSH protocol is implemented, this SSH client will not ask for a PTI and env and a shell. It will just ask for exec. So env is still there, but it will ask to execute something. And then it says exec request failed on channel zero. So in the next lecture, what I want to show you before we're going to start with the client is how do we execute single commands over SSH, which then uses the request type exec. And then I think we are ready to start implementation of a client. Let's pick up where we left. So we do the SSH command and instead of opening a shell, we want to send a command. So then we did an exec request. So what did we really hit here that we have this exec request failed? We have here the default, which captured the exec, but we need to have an exec for this request type. And what do we then need to do? We need to execute our WMI if what we supply this WMI. So let's just see what happens now. Now that we have this exec here, we reply true instead of false. Well, we reply true, but what now? Nothing happened. Nothing really happened. So let's have a look what the payload is. Payload and then rec.payload contains a payload. Rec type is a type, rec payload is a payload. And this payload is what we will have to analyze. Payload is WMI. So that's good that we know that the payload is WMI so that we can now use to send something back. Let's make a function of this. Execute something. And we're gonna pass a payload. The payload. And then what we can do is we can make a function, execute something, payload is byte, and then let's give maybe a string back. And then we can reuse this. Hup. And we can say exec something payload but payload is just gonna be who am I because here we already know what it is oh, and it should be bind exec something and then we return this but when do we return this only if the payload is only if the payload contains who am I and then we have a default what could be the default just not found, maybe. Command not found. Not sure if this N needs to be there. Probably yes. Just to make it nice. Case okay, WMI. Okay, let's convert this to a string. Command not found. And then let's also output the command. Command not found. And what is the command? The payload. Oh, we need the connection and still. Connection is of type SSH server connection. And then we also need to pause it twice here. Connection and the connection here. And then, so this returns a string. So then how do we reply this back? Let's have a look what's in rec. Mm, not much. What else do we have here? Channel. Channel right. We can write something back to the channel. Channel right. 
xx something and then we just need to convert it back to bytes because channel write expects bytes and then we have the reply so we say reply true we can reply that we can handle this type of exec and then we also write the response let's try that out sounds logical command not found who am i and i was expecting this because when i was preparing this lecture i figured out something interesting that is not easy to debug immediately because it says command not found who am i and i'm just checking here for who am i but how does this who am i really looks like if we translate this to bytes so if we have exec and then we will say empty print f let's say v and v and the first one will be byte who am i and the second one will be the payload so i want to see in bytes what who am i is in bytes and what the payload is in bytes and then i'm gonna get a difference and the first who am i is just a string so 119 104 and here <laughs> i have just in the payload some data before this who am i i'm not 100 sure what this prefix is here it's something in the sh protocol that i'm unaware of that i haven't read about yet and i'm just going to strip it because i don't need it but if i would need it or if i'm doing something wrong i would have to correct it later on in my github repository unfortunately but for me it works and for the goal client it also works so hopefully it will work for all the clients so how do you strip this? I can say payload binds trim, trim left. So there's also, I can trim my bytes from the left to remove this 0006. So this zero is actually nil bytes. So this doesn't really mean anything, but I still need to get this six away as well. Bytes trim left of the rec payload, which is of bytes and then the string trim left and is there stream left bytes maybe let's have a look trim okay trim prefix accepts bytes that's probably gonna be easier to deal with so i'm gonna say zero 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 six i want to remove that from the beginning of my bytes and then i'm gonna send this payload save this i can remove let's try to run it again and let's try to run my command again okay who am i you are edward vienna but what's happening here it is keeping the command open it's not closing it so there's still a reason why it is waiting for input from my channel i could just close the channel after i get the exec i guess because because if it sends the exec maybe you don't need a channel anymore and this is just how i want to do the implementation basically i'm not 100 percent sure if it's all rfc compatible but if i'm writing my own client and it's only my own client connecting i don't really need to be fully rfc compatible in my own script if i just want to do it quick and dirty if you would want to write a real ssh server and for people to download it you probably want to be RFC compatible so that every client can connect. But there are already a lot of SSH servers out there. I don't think you're going to release a new SSH server. These SSH servers that I am typically building are really for internal use to give a shell or be able to send some, some commands over encrypted using SSH keys so that we still have a secure connection. Or you might even use SSHD and only write the client. So I'm going to save this go run exit again and then here i closed my channel after i send a reply and then i get the correct output now there is something to add to make sure that you're compatible with multiple clients because the go client is going to want to see an exit code so an exit code is if you answer the exit code of the previous program then the exit code was 255 which is an error code if you just do who am i 
and I ask for the code then, I get zero, which means it is successfully exited. And this is something that clients will look for. So, so we can actually send another reply to our client. And just like we have request here, we can also send requests to our client. We can say channel, send a request, send a channel request, and it will wait for a reply if we want a reply. Send a request, we can say exit status. Do we want a reply? No. And what is our payload? We're just going to say our payload is four times zero, which will then translate in an exit code zero. And our Golang client will look for that. So if you don't have this line, then our Golang client in the next lecture might complain. So we just want to make sure that we have it here as well. So that's it. Let me just test this another time to make sure that it is still working and it is still working. And also if I now check for the exit code, I see zero instead of 255. So that's probably better that we send this along. Also something that we are not doing is this env. We could also have a case env and use this payload to set the, set the environment variables or have a look what it is sending. You are free to improve this SSH server. I was even thinking of maybe making a separate directory in my GitHub repository so that I have the server that I covered during the lecture and maybe a separate one for everyone who wants to do PRs to have some improvements because there can definitely be some more improvements. And then in the next lecture, we can work on a Golang client that we could use with this server, but maybe also with other Golang servers. Let's start now with our client. So I created the main Go in CMD client. And I just have a few lines that I already wrote here, just to make it easy. To read the mykey.pem and the server.pub. This mykey.pem is my private key that I would need to log into the SH server, otherwise I wouldn't get in. This is the same that I pass here, the mykey.pem. And the server.pub is the public key of a server. This is the public key that is now stored in known hosts, if I use SSH. Because the first time I connected, it asked, do you want to save this host? And then it saves a fingerprint of this public key. Now here, what I do is I already pass the server.pub so that I'm sure that I'm connecting to the right server. Then we need to parse these to the private key. We parse with the SSH parse private key and we pass them the bytes of the private key. And then we have the public key parsed, which is being parsed by the SSH parse authorized key. So this authorized key is the public key. And this authorized key gives back the public key, the comments, potential options, any other keys that would be in this public key, but this is only one, so I'm just ignoring this variable, and a potential error. And then how would I connect to this SSH server? I already showed it to you in the previous demo. There's a dial function. So let's have a look at the documentation. There's the dial function. So again, the crypto SSH documentation, and here we have the dial function. Either you go to the dial function or you go to the examples. There's also an example. So let's have a look. We have the dial, client dial, and here's an example. Dial starts a client connection to the given SSH server. It's a convenience function that connects to the given network address. So we need a network address, which is a string, initiates the SSH handshake and set up the client. For access to incoming channels and requests, use the net dial with new client connection instead. So this is a higher level dial function that we can use if we don't want to deal with channels and requests like in the server. So in the server, we have to define it. Here in the client, we can just use this higher level function that we don't really need to deal with channels and requests and we can use some higher level functions that will then initiate the request that we need. So just like the server, we need a client config we need a public key. So let's just copy paste this. Client config, 
then we're going to change this because the authentication method that we are going to use is not password but is key based and then we're going to dial protocol is tcp this is going to be localhost 2022 and then the config so i'm just going to copy paste this config the username can be username you're not really checking on it and the authentication method is going to be public keys so public keys has the correct return method which is out method we are looking for out method so we can actually have multiple out methods if you wanted but we are only going to use the keys ssh signer the signer is this one private key parsed this is the private key that we supply and then the host key callback is the public key that we need so it's a fixed host key it's the public key parsed because this is the sh public key so this is our sh config localhost 2022 i think it was and let's see go run seem declined go i think it connected did it connect maybe not let's clear this just to be sure just to be sure oh it logged in with key so it connected but it didn't do anything there's no requests going so how do we make sure that there are requests going so that we can execute something or you could also start a shell if you wanted to but starting a shell you could as well use the ssh command so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to execute who am i just to see how that works because typically when you write a go client that does something with ssh you're gonna just execute a command show the output and then exit client new session client new session opens a new session for this client so let's try this new session is session and error session error new session and then we need to do something with this session let's just see what this function does so go run what does session do nothing yet okay well let's continue session now that we have the session keyword we just need to add a colon here now that we have the session keyword we can do something with it so we have run shell wait or we have output and output runs a cmd on the remote host and returns it returns its standard output that's kind of what we are looking for we just want to send a command and show the output so this session we also need to close when we are finished so we're going to say the first session close and then the output is a byte and an error so out var out byte and then out error equals session output what are we going to execute who am i and well actually if i just define it like this then i don't need this output variable okay if there's an error then session output error session output error and if there is a new client error new session error if there's a new session error then new session error and then we can just output out i guess output is out so let's see what this is going to do it's not doing any request right now but i expect that this output is then going to do an exec request with the payload who am i and the output will then be outputted here on screen let's have a look go run client.go and we see that the only request that is made is the exec request because the session output uses the exec request and will then collect this output and you are username and why is this not edward viana because the username that we supply this time is username and not edward viana you have to supply a username but we are not really using the username in our server we are just checking on this key 
if he wouldn't supply his key, then we wouldn't be able to, to log in. So if I would not supply this key, what would happen then? Handshake failed. No authentication passed. What would happen if I would pass a password? It would be the same. It would also give us a handshake fail because we are not supporting any password method. If you just want to use password, you could change the server and then implement the password method, check on login and password, maybe even with a third party database, and then allow users that way. So this is how we can implement a client. So this client is pretty straightforward, thanks to this high level function that we have dial, we don't really need to deal with these sessions and requests because our session output is doing that for us. We just pass a command, it sends a command using the exec, just like we did with our SSH command that was being passed here. And then it just outputs the output or we have the output in this variable that we can then use. So this is actually quite interesting because we could have like a CICD pipeline where we have this client, for example, that would make a connection to an SSH server and execute something, show it on screen and exit. And this all you could then potentially integrate with other Go packages to integrate this with an API or with a product in AWS or with something in Kubernetes. So just being able to programmatically make a secure connection to a server using the keys that you probably already have is quite powerful.